Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Council Member Steve Levin, Chair of the City Council's Committee on General Welfare. Today, we are holding an oversight hearing on the client experience at HRA centers, as well as 12 bills and one resolution that aim to ensure that all HRA clients are treated with respect, compassion, and professionalism, and ensure that HRA employees have the resources that they need to do their jobs effectively and efficiently. I believe that all of us are familiar with the story of Jasmine Headley, and she's joined us today, and we thank her. Starting a December day, attempting to reinstate her child care subsidy and ending the day with her child ripped from her arms and her placed in handcuffs. I think I speak for everyone up here when I say that we are grateful that Ms. Headley is here with us today. I'm sure that reliving this incident is not easy, and we appreciate her sharing her story so that we could learn from her extremely upsetting experience. Regrettably, as Ms. Headley herself has said, unfortunate experiences at HRA centers are not unique to her case. This is a system-wide issue, and it reveals the criminalization of poverty that too many New Yorkers face. The Urban Justice Center's Safety Net Project has just published a report highlighting the challenges New Yorkers face while trying to obtain public assistance and SNAP benefits. Most of the HRA clients surveyed felt that they had been spoken to inappropriately. Many reported having their paperwork lost by HRA, and a large majority said that their calls were not answered. They also found average wait times of over three hours at job centers and two hours and 45 minutes at SNAP centers. The survey results showed clear improvements compared to a similar study conducted in 2014. In the five years of Commissioner Banks' leadership, HRA has undergone significant modernization and streamlining efforts by increasing self-service options, online applications and recertification, mobile document uploads, and client-initiated scheduling for interviews on demand. We appreciate everything that has been done to make the system work better, but clearly more needs to be done. Today, I hope we can discuss how we can work together to expedite improvements and ensure cultural, culture of mutual respect. The committee will hear 13 pieces of legislation, including intro 1359, a bill that I'm sponsoring, to require DSS to issue a public report on instances in which public assistance for a recipient was terminated and the recipient reapplied for such public assistance. I believe that transparency is key in identifying gaps and tracking progress at DSS. I look forward to hearing feedback on the legislative package we are hearing today and discussing how we can all work together to improve the system. I also look forward to hearing the firsthand accounts of clients who experienced the concrete implementation of city policies on the ground, and I ask that DSS summarize their testimony and Commissioner Banks stay after delivering his testimony to hear these powerful statements. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us today. We are joined by Councilmember Chaim Deutsch of Brooklyn, Councilmember Alika Amprey Samuel of Brooklyn, Councilmember Vanessa Gibson of the Bronx, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal of Manhattan, of course, our speaker, Corey Johnson, Councilmember Majority Leader Lori Cumbo of Brooklyn, Councilmember Barry Gredenchik of Queens, Councilmember Adrian Adams of Queens, Councilmember Diana Ayala of the Bronx, and Councilmember Antonio Reynoso of Brooklyn. We expect to be joined by more colleagues as the hearing progresses. Lastly, I'd like to thank the staff of the General Welfare Committee, Aminta Kilowan, Senior Counsel, and Tanya Cyrus and Crystal Pond, Senior Policy Analyst, and Julia Haramis, Finance Analyst, for putting this hearing together. I'd also like to thank my Chief of Staff, Jonathan Boucher, and Legislative Director, Elizabeth Adams. I'd now like to turn it over to our speaker, Corey Johnson, for his remarks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chair Levin. I'm Council Member Corey Johnson, Speaker of the New York City Council. And I want to thank everyone for coming out to this important hearing. I'd also like to thank, again, Chair Levin for his steadfast dedication to this issue and the Committee on General Welfare for addressing it this afternoon. I want to thank Commissioner Steve Banks for being here today. I see him sitting in the audience. Uh, to continue the dialogue we started a few weeks ago. And finally, I want to thank each and every one of you who is here today to provide feedback on how we can improve the experience of clients at HRA centers. I want to thank Anthony Wells for being here as well. His uh, testimony today is important. As the largest social service agency in the entire country, HRA assists in providing New Yorkers with their most essential needs. 
HRA helps more than 3 million New Yorkers annually through the administration of more than 12 major public assistance programs, including food assistance, also known as SNAP, cash assistance, public health insurance, and child care. These programs make up our social safety net, keep people out of poverty, and provide vulnerable New Yorkers with what they need to survive. We know that under the leadership of Commissioner Banks, HRA is working towards making significant improvements to its systems and processes to ensure that their clients are best served. We are grateful for these efforts. But last December, we were horrifically reminded of how much more must be done. On December 7th, New Yorkers were rightfully outraged by an incident that occurred at an HRA center in Brooklyn. Footage of a mother whose baby was pried from her arms before she was arrested in an HRA center went viral. That mother, Ms. Jasmine Headley, is here with us today. Jasmine, I want to thank you for being here. I recognize that this might not be easy for you, and I am deeply grateful for your bravery and for your presence today. Watching the video of what happened to Jasmine was painful and heartbreaking. Unfortunately, we can't go back in time, but we can do our best to ensure these kinds of incidents do not happen to families in the future. As elected officials, that's our responsibility. The system has to change. Today, we're hearing a package of 13 bills intended to improve a client's experience when they visit an HRA center. My bill, Introduction 1332, would create an Office of Special Handler at the Department of Social Services. This office would establish a system to hear complaints about the termination of benefits, review those decisions, and ensure effective communication with clients when benefits are terminated. This is an important bill. If someone had caught that there was a bureaucratic error with Jasmine's benefits, she wouldn't have needed to waste her time coming into the center that day, waiting hours to resolve her issue, ultimately having to go through that traumatic and painful experience. I hope this hearing is the beginning of a robust conversation on how we can work together to ensure that what happened to Jasmine Headley never happens again. No family should experience the trauma that Jasmine and her baby had to face. We must do better. I want to thank all the sponsors of our bill package for their work on this important issue. I look forward to getting an update from the administration today on the actions that HRA announced they would take in response to what happened to Jasmine Headley. And additionally, I hope that this hearing provides us with an opportunity to look broadly at a client's experience at HRA centers and what we can do to ensure that every step along the way is efficient and humane. I also want to apologize. I'm going to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry on behalf of the city of New York. I'm sorry you ever had to go to that HRA center. I'm sorry that you and your baby had to experience that trauma. I'm sorry that you were wrongfully kept on Rikers Island for multiple days away from your family. You deserve so much more than you received. And I am deeply, deeply apologetic that you had to have this experience. And I am similarly deeply, deeply grateful for your bravery, for you wanting to be here today, for you wanting to tell your story, for you wanting to ensure that this ha doesn't have to happen to anyone else. And I know there are some things that you aren't going to be able to talk about today, and that is perfectly fine. We want you to feel comfortable. We want you to tell your story in whatever way makes you feel comfortable. And we want to acknowledge the pain that you've gone through. And hopefully, your testimony here today will be a catalyst for change in the future. So thank you, Jasmine Headley. Thank you. And I turn it back over to our chair, Steve Levin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 
We'll now hear uh, brief remarks from our bill sponsors and uh, members if we can keep uh, the remarks uh, uh, brief uh, because we have so many pieces of legislation, uh, we would appreciate that. Uh, Councilmember Adams. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair and uh, Ms. Headley. I told you this in the past. I look at you when I see my daughter. I look at your baby and I see my grandson. So I feel you. And like the speaker, I too am so sorry for what you went through, days that you can't get back. But just know that you have allies here at City Council who are working with you and for you on your behalf. So over the past year, we've received many accounts of poor treatments of people visiting HRA centers in need of assistance. And I think the world um, has seen the video uh, of your child being pulled from your arms at a Brooklyn HRA center. And the arrest that you went through was completely unnecessary. So after the unfortunate escalation in your case, Jasmine, and so many others, we here at City Council must take steps to ensure that this doesn't happen again. What's happening inside of some HRA offices in the name of law and order must be reformed, and we're here to help to do that. Vulnerable New Yorkers shouldn't have to second guess how they will be treated in these offices, so I'm very proud to join my colleagues in introducing a package of legislation to improve treatment of clients and quality of service at HRA centers. My bill is intro 1333, and that would require the Department of Social Services, Human Resources Admin Administration to issue a quarterly report on use of force incidents that occur in a DSS HRA office. The report would be submitted to the council and published on the DSS HRA website. This bill would also require the New York City Police Department to issue a quarterly report on use of force incidents that occur in DSS HRA offices in which the NYPD responded. The report would be submitted to the council and published on the NYPD website. I encourage all of my colleagues to support this bill. Intro 1333, like the other bills in this package, is a necessary step to improve accountability and transparency we must ensure that the agency improves their policies and protocols to prevent future trauma from families in need. We must ensure that this never happens again. We must ensure that there is never another Jasmine Headley incident. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Adams. I just want to let the folks know who are slated to give uh, opening statements. We have Councilmember Amprey Samuel, Majority Leader Cumbo, Councilmember Rosenthal, and Councilmember Deutsch. I really want to let Ms. Headley testify as quickly as possible and not keep her here for an extended period of time. So if it is possible, if you need to give an opening statement, that's fine. But please keep it to one minute so that we can hear from Ms. Headley as soon as possible. I don't want her to sit here all day and, uh, and listen to us. I want to be able to actually ask her questions. So next up is Councilmember Ambry Samuel, then Majority Leader Cumbo, then Councilmember Rosenthal, then Councilmember Joyce. Deutsch, if anyone wants to waive their time, that would be great. But if you do want to keep it, please keep it to a minute. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Chair Levin, for the opportunity to speak on my bills. And thank you for your leadership during this time. In December, we watched a video of a mother carrying her one-year-old son simply trying to correct an issue that was not her fault with her child care payments. And this video had 8.9 million views across the country. Jasmine Headley was subjected to inappropriate wait times at HRA and became the victim of aggressive use of force by HRA peace officers and members of the NYPD. And just watching the video, you can see where other workers didn't know what to do as the incident escalated by law enforcement. As members of the New York City Council and an amplified voice for the people we represent, we have to be responsive. We have to figure out ways to handle very difficult situations and make sure that the government and its bureaucracies are working on behalf of the people they are supposed to serve. The bills that we have introduced that I've introduced along with Majority Leader Cumbo and Chair Levin will help create a respectful and supportive environment for families who visit HRA centers. 
we already heard which bills. I've introduced 1335, 1337, and 1336. And I really hope that all of these bills will be able to really address the level of disrespect, demoralizing, and demeaning treatment felt by New Yorkers within our centers. As a city and a nation, we have got to do better. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to open up by just saying and echoing the sentiments of Speaker Corey Johnson in terms of how proud we are that you are here. Um, as a mom myself, and my son is 18 months old, I couldn't help but see the video and see myself in you. And so today is really a coming full circle in terms of the ability to see you and the courage that you still have here in the chamber and City Hall. I am proud to put forward legislation 1347, which is an innovative approach to provide clients and opportunity to have the ability to schedule appointments online and over the phone because you shouldn't have even had to have been there in the first place. These are issues that could be rectified over the phone or online and we want to make sure that working moms can continue to be working moms and to do their work and to get back to work as quickly as possible. Also our HRA centers must have full-time social workers on staff. Noted in intro 1335 sponsored in partnership with council member Amprey Samuel. There must be people on staff staff who are understanding, who are compassionate, and understand these critical issues. And I will, in the interest of time, turn it back to my colleague to also do their intro. And thank you so much for being here. Councilmember Gibson. Thank you, Chair Levin. Thank you to our speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I am Council Member Vanessa Gibson of District 16 in the Bronx, and my particular bill in this package that we're hearing today is Intro 1350, which would require the Commissioner of Social Services to address complaints based on the findings of an audit um, on DSS and HRA job centers. And this bill would allow the Commissioner to make every effort to ensure that recommended standards of reasonableness are met at every every job and SNAP center. A report will be posted on HRA's website and submitted to the City Council by April 1st of 2020. And certainly given all that we have heard uh, in this city, and certainly thank you, Jasmine, for being here, we must make sure we hold everyone to a higher level of standard and make sure that we do not criminalize going to HRA and job centers. I appreciate all of the incredible advocacy of the Women's Caucus, Progressive Caucus, the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus. I want to thank you all for being here. Councilmember Rosenthal. Everyone must be treated with dignity and respect. With gratitude for our speaker, uh, Corey Johnson, for skillfully guiding the process to get us to this point. The point of this hearing is to move city government so that everyone is treated with dignity and respect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Rosenthal. And Councilmember Deutsch. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm gonna be brief. Um, today I'm introducing a bill that aims to collect uh, data so that we can better understand how dire the situation is <clears throat> for our city's most vulnerable. My bill would require a yearly report from DSS and HRA about how many resolved and unresolved complaints were received from clients. Furthermore, this report would include the methods that DSS, HRA will undertake to better resolve complaints and its progress in resolving complaints. The report would be required to be sent to the Speaker's office and to be posted annually on the DSS, HRA website to offer transparency to the people of this city. We as a council must shine a light in the dark corners of the city to expose the serious problems that our fellow New Yorkers face. The decisive action that we are taking, led by our speaker Corey Johnson and my colleagues, will fight to ensure that nobody ever again experiences what Jasmine did. I thank all my colleagues for their important bills to address the issues relating to DSS HRA, and I thank Chair Levin for his leadership on these 13 bills, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Deutsch. Lastly, Councilmember Williams. Thank you, uh, I'll be brief. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman uh, and the Speaker. I'm proud to uh, sponsor intro 1389, local law that will require the Department of 
social services and the HRA to report on termination of public assistance, as well as co-sponsoring intro 1336, which I'm sure was spoken about. I'm proud to be a part of this council uh, raising these issues. Thank you for being here and representing so many people who are not. I am also just want to lift up uh, mothers from ACS whose babies are being taken from them for the crime of being poor, not for neglect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilor Williams. Okay. Well, we want to thank all of our sponsors, and we want to thank Ms. Headley for being here, and we look forward to hearing her remarks. Um, first of all, I want to thank the speaker for making my client cry before she has to speak. Um, just a joke. I'm sorry. Um, no, it is, um, it is, I just wanted to thank the city council for the support that you gave me and have consistently give Brooklyn Defender Services so that we can help people like Jasmine Headley and others who are um, in these same similar circumstances. But I particularly wanted to thank Chair Levin as well as the speaker. I also wanted to thank Borough President Eric Adams and I think also Letitia James who really came forward early and was very, very, very helpful. And I want you all to know that the, the, the support that you gave Ms. Headley during this incident and today and since then has really meant a lot to her. I wanted to say that on her behalf so she can speak for herself on the rest of it. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jasmine Headley. Um, I just want to thank everyone for allowing me to have this time to speak and tell my truth. Um, I'm 24 years old. I have a one-year-old son named Damon. I live in Brooklyn where I live for most of my life. Every day I work hard to make a brighter future for my son, just like my amazing mother did for me. The events that took place on December 7th changed my life, but also brought attention to issues that affected people every day, especially from well, especially those from my community. Um, I'm here today because I want to make sure that what happened to me never happens to anyone else. I speak today to shine a light on a problem that impacts many. I want to thank the city council again for giving me this opportunity to speak today. We need to change the ways HRA provide services to people when they are most in need. I also want to share a little bit about what happened to me that day. On December 7th, I went to HRA in Brooklyn to find out why HRA had cut off my son's childcare. I never received the notice. I also wanted to check on my public assistance case. Like many working single mothers, I needed childcare so I could continue working. To go to HRA, I had to call out of work on that Friday. I had to miss a day of work and not get paid to fix the problem with my childcare voucher. I took the whole day off work because I knew I would have to wait and wait for a long time. Because my son no longer received childcare, he could not go to daycare that day. I had to take him with me to the HRA office. Knowing we would be there for a while, I came prepared. The night before, I packed a bag for my son, his bottle, his diapers, his favorite toy is a little Paw Patrol figurine that he lost. And other items. Though it's kind of hard to know, you're going to have to spend almost all day getting just one or two services. I knew it was worth it for Damon, my son. I got there around 9.50 a.m. that day. My son was not permitted to go to the play area at the HRA office because He's not fully potty trained yet. So we stuck together. I am a new mom. I'm a single parent. I need a childcare so I can be able to work and build on our future. I want to go back to school eventually. I also want to give my son the best life possible within the state of New York. So after taking off work, then waiting for many hours, making no progress with my public assistance case. I was exhausted. I sat on the floor with my son in the stroller. I was just gonna wait it out. As everyone knows from watching the video, 
A simple desire to rest ended up in me getting arrested. During the process, my son was violently removed from me and nobody will ever know the love we have for our children. No one can take that from you. Unless you are a parent, Unless you're a parent. Take your time. Unless you are a parent who has a child taken from you, you will never know or be able to relate to the pain that I felt that day. Excuse me, guys. I'm sorry. Take no, your no. time. Take, please take your time. You got this. After I was arrested, I was took. I was took in the central book in. Thank you. I was took in the central book in. I had to stay in terrible conditions for hours, many hours. I don't know how long. But finally, I was brought to court where I met my defense attorney from Brooklyn Defender Services. And he was like an angel to me. The first person trying to help me. During this ordeal, I was separated from my son for the first time in his life. I had my son in Charlotte, North Carolina. I did not have him in New York City. So um, the medical field there operates different. When you give birth to your child, which I had a natural birth, um, you are not separated from your child, like the New York system where you're you know, getting testing and all that stuff. But I'm sorry, I just had to share that with you. Um, while the video of my arrest was seen by millions of people around the world, To think it all started from me just trying to provide for my son. And yes, I may need help from time to time or have to get help from time to time, but getting help doesn't mean I'm not a person. It doesn't mean I can't be, that I can be treated in any way. Honestly, what happened to me felt like a slap in the face. I've given my life to this city. I was born here. Raised here, I paid taxes, I went to school here, keep and kept good jobs. I'm a part of a community. I've done what I was supposed to do. I've done what I had to do. It felt like no one cared about me or what I had to say, nothing mattered. I was just a number, a ticket, a problem, and I know each day, so many people had the same experience. It's not just the fact that I was arrested, it's the harsh way that I was treated by people who are supposed to help me. But the way the arrest happened, the whole situation is hard to imagine and to live with. But right now, I'm doing what I can to move forward. I don't really have a choice. I have to survive and take care of my son. But. Just because I'm trying to move on doesn't mean I'm not still troubled and haunted by the traumatic events that happened. Excuse me. Certain things and situations still give me anxiety and make me worried. I keep a lot inside because I have responsibilities. But really, it was a painful experience and I still have pain inside of me. I know I'm not the first person that this happened to. That's why I'm taking this opportunity to speak my truth to the story that has been told by many already. I do believe that HRA centers need some changes so we can stop violent responses to people in need. My first point is HRA has different caseworkers for different services. 
I should have been addressed all of my, I should have been able to address all of my needs with one person who knows me and understands me. We live in the state of New York. There is absolutely no reason that every person could have a, curse, a case worker to address all of the needs who knows and understands them. Staff should be trained about the psychological experience of what a person has to endure. It often feels like there is a constant contradiction, a game of cat and mouse with HRA staff where they try to find a reason to deny you and support you or support your needs. HRA offices don't have enough workers. Workers are often saying people are out of the office. They should have enough staff to fill in for people so that nobody has to wait hours just to be seen. Social workers, not security officers. Social workers, not security officers should be available. Police should never be called in, in these situations. In my case, I was just sitting a peaceful act. Really, it comes down to treating all people, including working people, mothers, poor people, young people, with dignity and respect. Thank you all for giving me this opportunity to speak, and I'm very grateful for being here today. And I just want all you guys to know. Brooklyn Defendant Services has testimony prepared for the specific bills, but of course, if you have anything you would like to ask Ms. Headley. Sure, I think a, a few of us will ask questions of Ms. Headley, and then we'd be happy to hear from, um, from the organization about testimony on the bills and on the incident. Um, I don't really have any questions for you, uh, because I think you said it perfectly. I am incredibly amazed and impressed by your composure, by your bravery. I wish I had that level of courage at 24 years old to be here today and to sit up here and to talk about something so painful. So um, I, I just want to again say thank you and uh, to let you know that whatever support is needed uh, from the City Council to uh, the wonderful lawyers who are representing you. Uh, we've uh, been there since the beginning, and we want to make sure that there is justice for you, Jasmine, and uh, for your family. And so I'm going to um, turn it over. Uh, Chairman Levin, are you okay if I turn to Majority Leader Cumbo, who I think had a few remarks she wanted to make, and then we'll turn it back to Chair Levin. So thank you, Jasmine. Again, thank you, Jasmine, so much for the courage. You have really become unwillingly but a spokeswoman for so many women, particularly black women all across the city of New York. And I just want to briefly read something that I read outside, but it is a Sojourner Truth's Ain't I a Woman speech. And she says there, she says that man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me any best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me, look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man if I could get it, and bear the lash as well, and ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children and seen most all sold off into slavery, and when I cried out with a mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me, and ain't I a woman? And I, I believe that speech, ain't I a woman, that was read in 1851, we're still asking and commanding that question today. As a black woman in New York City, 
ain't I a woman begs to ask the question of, I deserve the respect, I deserve the same treatment, I deserve the dignity, the care, and the compassion as any woman here in New York City. And so I really express to you, I, when I saw the video, I saw me in so many ways. I know what it's like, of course, to be black, to be a woman, to be a mother, and to be a single woman in New York City. And I saw from the videos just how much and how strongly you would do anything to protect your child. And I would do the same exact thing for my son, to protect him in the same way. And I know as a single black woman mother in New York City, you have to carry yourself at all times with the don't even think about messing with me because I am the toughest woman in the entire world. And sometimes all that strength gets um, misunderstood where people think you don't need help, you don't need support, you don't need a chair, you don't need a compassion, you don't need anyone to help you up the stairs in the train. And so we're really here today to really show our level of support for you. And the only question that I really had was that we're trying to understand the services that are happening at HRA. And you said in your speech today that you took a day off from work, you packed a full bag, and I know what packing that full bag is, yep. and the toys and the clothes and the extra change of clothes and the extra everything. Why did you go through so much preparation just to go to the office before? What experiences had you had before that let you know, I have to do all of this. I have to take a day off from work. It's not going to be I can take a half day or I can go late or any of those particular experiences. What experiences had you had previously before this day? Um, just daily outings. You can't go anywhere without the extra bag of things for your child. Um, based off of my childhood, yeah, uh, my mother had a case before, and I know in that situation, it always takes a long time. You're already pre-warned. My own mother told me. You know, Jazz, we have to go take care of some business. It's going to be a while. You know, we always brung food or we were able to eat beforehand because there is a wait time. Guaranteed. And was this your first time coming to an HRA office as, a, as an adult, as a woman? Uh, may have been my second time. And is your son back in daycare? My son is back in daycare. Yes. And my son will be celebrating his birthday soon, and we're going to be going to see Sesame Place at Madison Square Garden. We'd love if you could come. Nice. I would <laughs> gladly appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And those are the types of conversations we really should be having. Right. So I thank you for that. Those are the memories that our children should have. And those are the types of normal conversations that two black mothers should be having. And so I hope that we can have more of those moving forward. And you're stuck with me. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Jasmine, I want to uh, thank you for your testimony. And um, I want to acknowledge <clears throat> that your strength and, um, and your bravery um, for coming up here and speaking your truth is extraordinary. And, um, you know, sometimes for whatever reason, we're placed into yep. situations and circumstances um, that demand extraordinary responses from us. And what you have demonstrated, and how you have spoken to so many people. Um, has, you have risen to that challenge. You have risen to that challenge. And we are all in admiration mm -hmm. of you being here today. And we thank you. And we look forward to hearing more from you and we look forward to working with you and 
getting to know you. And as Laurie said, you're stuck with all of us, actually. So. Um, and, uh, and we just want to express our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Um, Lisa, do you want to deliver remarks on behalf of Brooklyn Defenders? Thank you. Um, actually, I'm going to pass it to Anka Grigor, who is a supervising attorney in our civil action practice. Hi, my name is Anka Grigori. I'm, as Lisa just said, a supervising attorney, uh, where one of the things that uh, my unit specifically specializes in is assisting our clients with their benefits issues. Um, we thank the City Council Committee on General Welfare and Chair Stephen Levin for this opportunity to testify today and bring to light even more client experiences uh, at HRA centers. Because as has been repeated several times today, Unfortunately, Jasmine's experience and, and the way that she was treated at HRA, the frustrations and the wait times are not unique, <clears throat> excuse me, to Jasmine. I want to tell the story of a couple other of our clients to supplement Jasmine's stories um, with the council's understanding that these stories have become par for the course at HRA centers. Uh, the first example is of Miss J, a single mother as well, to three severely special needs children. On top of that, Ms. J suffers from her own disabilities, so she is homebound as well. Uh, her children require around-the-clock special care, and so she's reliant on Medicaid for that care. When it came time to her recertification, she received a homebound appointment, as is supposed to be the case, uh, for her to be able to recertify. Unfortunately, those caseworkers left her without any receipt, no evidence of this visit, none of their contact information. Her case later closed due to failure to recertify. She was desperate. She'd never let her case close before. She's very diligent, knowing how much her children rely on these Medicaid benefits. Her entire case was turned off, including her Medicaid. She, we tried to get her another homebound appointment, but the wait was too long. So Ms. J dragged herself into a center and made sure to bring all the necessary documentation. She knew how to recertify. She knew what documents they would need so that she wouldn't have to keep going back over and over and over again. Unfortunately, her caseworker was rude and was demanding documents from her that are not required under HRA rules and regulations. I called the HRA caseworker, I called supervisors, I called every single day, multiple times a day for two weeks straight to try to get some attention to this matter. I was told, I don't understand why you're helping her. I was told, I don't understand why you care so much and rejected over and over and over again. Eventually, they stopped answering my phone calls. I called from my personal cell phone and they answered. It was clear that they were disappointed that I had been able to reach them on the phone. They said to me that they were gonna do this on their own timeline and they were not concerned about our client's emergency needs. I kept calling up the chain of command until eventually the client's benefits were turned back on, but after far too much delay. We have another client, Ms. A, who similarly after a merely verbal altercation at an HRA center, NYPD was called, she was arrested, and a full order protection was placed between her and her caseworker. She was due for recertification, that's why she was there that day. She couldn't recertify her case, and it closed. She was desperate for these benefits. She was not allowed to go back into the center to recertify because of the full order of protection. She tried calling around but as most people know, it's impossible to get anybody from HRA on the phone. She eventually came to our office and came to me where I was able to call the director directly of another center and get her an appointment there to recertify. But she had already missed on so many necessary benefits. And if it wasn't for me having access to these HRA director's phone numbers, she would have had absolutely no recourse in this situation. With one more client, Ms. P, uh, who's a Spanish speaker, she went to a center with one of our caseworkers at our office who does HRA advocacy for our unit um, to assist her in just filling out a form that she needed for her benefits. The form was only given to her in English. They requested it in Spanish, they were refused. Our caseworker started filling out the form for her because she speaks both English and Spanish, but our client could not understand the form. The caseworker started telling her that she was committing fraud. You're not allowed to fill out a form for one of your clients. I'm, I'm closing this entire case and sending it up to our fraud investigation unit. 
our case we're going to try to explain to her she can't understand the form I'm just helping her fill it out I'm asking her the questions and filling them in she refused to hear it she physically shoved the papers back in our caseworkers face and sent them out of the office eventually with some advocacy again calling up to directors we were able to just submit this simple form on behalf of our clients so once again and there are more stories in our written testimony this is just to show more examples of how this has become par for the course for treatment at HRA centers. So we do want to comment on some of the bills being introduced today. We mostly want to say that you know we support all of the bills being introduced. We also support all of the recommendations that Jasmine herself just stated. To briefly comment on each bill, first with intro 1332, we support uh, an office being created, the Office of a Special Handler. We do want to comment and say an office exists called the Office of Constituent Services that has clearly so far been inadequate. We hope that an Office of a Special Handler will look at the ways that the Office of Constituent Services has been inadequate and try to address some of those inadequacies. One way we can do that is that the Office of the Special Handler should be available at every center. It should be available, it should be accessible, and it should be known about by regular clients at HRA centers. Secondly, to address all of the data collection and reporting bills together, we support greater transparency in terms of the HRA centers. We do want to specifically address intro 1333 uh, regarding the NYPD reporting. Um, I'll speak to that one. Um, but before I talk about that, there is one bill that adds access to a social worker, which we very much appreciate um, and think will be very powerful. But we have some concerns that the more things that, the more obstacles or lines that somebody might have to work on, the more people that they have to get through to get help, sometimes creates more of a barrier than an assistance. So I think it's really important that we be very careful about what the role of the social worker might be, because I can envision a situation where a caseworker says, I won't talk to you until you see the social worker, and there's a line up there. So I just want us to be very mindful of not creating more of a problem, because with a bureaucracy the way that HRA is now, you run into you know, a risk of that kind of obstacle. Um, I did want to say that um, the, the problem with, uh, of course, we appreciate more reporting about the use of force at any centers, and we believe that it's very important to start to understand what's happening when police are called. I think one of the issues that needs to be looked at a lot more carefully is what the solution is if the workers don't feel that they can handle a situation, when they call the police, why they call the police. But I would like to go back to an issue that was pointed out by Councilmember Williams before he left, which is that um, police are regularly involved in removals of children when they are being removed by ACS. And my office is the primary provider for uh, parents, mostly women, who are involved in ACS proceedings, oftentimes for issues that are mostly related to poverty and are often not very, very serious where the children are in danger. Um, so police are often brought with ACS workers, and the outcome of those interactions might look a lot more like what you saw on the video than most people probably realize. And I agree with him, and I just call upon the council at some point to really dig a little deeper into that issue. I think one of the reasons that the officers in this circumstance were so adamant about the way that they were removing the child is related to the fact that they do it quite often, much more than I think most people understand. With that, I would like to conclude our testimony and thank the council very much. And I think we all owe Ms. Headley an incredible thanks and support for coming forward is very, she is very is a very brave thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Lisa, I want to thank uh, you all for being here. Uh, Jasmine, I want to thank you for being here. We really, really appreciate it, and we look forward to uh, continuing to support you as you move forward. And anything you need, as Lisa knows. Uh, please do not hesitate to call upon us. So thank you so much. And now we're going to call up uh, Commissioner Banks from HRA uh, and whoever else is testifying with them to come up. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Steve. Thanks, Commissioner Ranks, for being here. I'm going to ask the committee council to uh, please swear you in. Commissioner, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. You may begin. If you could also swear in Administrator Bonilla, please. Thank you. Commissioner, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Steve, you may begin. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna summarize my testimony, but I, at first I, I wanna both say thank you both, uh, Mr. Speaker and Mr. Chair, for your kind words about what we've done. But I think that the power of Jasmine Headsley's testimony is how much more remains for us to do. And, you know, notwithstanding the significant reform efforts, that have been implemented over the last five years as painfully illustrated by Ms. Headley's testimony and conversations that I personally had with individual clients. On any given day, a client may experience challenges at any one of our offices that don't reflect the major policy changes we've made, our values, or the dedication of the vast majority of our staff who come to work uh, at DSS to help people in need. Uh, in the testimony uh, before you begin with questions, I want to highlight the immediate actions that we have taken uh, hearing the kinds of pain that are reflected in both Ms. Headley's testimony and in the recent report from the Safety Net activists. I just want to make sure that those are clear on the record what the immediate actions we've taken. But I also want to highlight some of the overall common sense changes that we are making uh, and uh, so I think it's relevant to how they interact with the, the various bills that are before the committee. Uh, as you know, at two council hearings in December and immediately after uh, the matter came to light, I spoke about the actions that we took following this horrible incident. Uh, and I would like to again apologize uh, to Ms. Headley and her one-year-old son and to the people of the city of New York uh, for what happened uh, that was utterly unacceptable in one of our offices. And I think as a public official, it's important to acknowledge uh, that this was utterly unacceptable and to apologize to someone who was so painfully affected by what happened. And I have to say on a personal level, and Speaker, I've known you and I've known you, uh, Chair, and, and many others this committee for a long time. You know, what happened to Ms. Headley when she turned to us for help has caused me to look in the mirror to see what more I can do to deepen the reforms we've implemented so that nothing like uh, that ever happens again. Uh, we've already enacted a series of immediate reforms to address this horrible uh, incident and we're taking additional steps that I'm describing today because I think the power of Ms. Headley's testimony is beyond the, her own experience but how she reflected on the experiences of others. Uh, immediately following the incident, I placed the two HRA peace officers on modified duty with no client contact. Consistent with the collective bargaining agreement, I suspended the these two officers without pay for the maximum period of time. Following these suspensions, one officer has resigned from the agency and one has been assigned to administrative duties pending disciplinary charges that have been filed which could result in termination. Listening to what happened to Ms. Headley, going forward, unless there is an immediate safety threat, I have directed that HRA peace officers shall not request the intervention of the NYPD without first contacting the center director or deputy director or her or his designee to attempt to defuse any situation by addressing a client need as opposed to what happened in Ms. Headley's case. As part of this new procedure, we will be implementing a social worker pilot 
at one job center in each of the five boroughs to support the center directors in diffusing such situations by addressing a client's need for immediate help. The pilot will enable us to test the effectiveness of this new approach at these five centers, one in each borough. Last month, DSS reinforced guidelines for staff to treat clients with courtesy and respect. DSS immediately began conducting retraining sessions for all HRA peace officers with an emphasis on techniques for de-escalating disputes in HRA centers. 87 out of the 97 current peace officers have received this enhanced training. The remaining 10 are on leave and will receive the retraining when they return to work. Uh, and within that 10 is a new hire or two. This will be a mandatory annual uh, requirement for each officer. I have personally attended each of these retraining sessions to speak to the HRA peace officers regarding the importance of de-escalating disputes. I want to thank you for doing that, Commissioner. Thank you. Going forward, we'll be providing all HRA peace officers with body-worn cameras, which I think reflects the very productive conversations that we had with you, Speaker, and you, a Majority Leader, and you, Chair, and, and uh, other leaders here, Council Member Lika Samuels, uh, and Council Member Donovan. Uh, DSS has directed the city contracted security services vendor to provide retraining sessions for all security guards assigned to HRA centers who are not peace officers, with an emphasis on techniques for de escalating disputes in HRA centers. Thereafter, this training will be a mandatory annual requirement for any contracted security officer assigned to an HRA office. All but 15 of the contracted security staff have been trained and the rest will be trained tonight. In addition to existing DSS customer service staff training, DSS will begin implementing implicit bias training for all 17,000 DSS staff members, including both HRA and DSS, to promote diversity in the workplace and dignity-centered client services. Last month, I appointed Lawana Kimbrough, who's here today, to be DSS's first Chief Diversity and Equity Officer. In this new position, she will develop agency initiatives that address staff engagement, recruitment, and advancement, and build capacity of staff at all levels to respond effectively to structural racism and individual bias. Further, she will promote culturally competent programs and inform policies, training, hiring practices, and service delivery to ensure continuity and sustainability in promoting equitable outcomes for clients and staff. As part of her immediate responsibilities, she will be focusing on the development of the implicit bias training. With support from the Open Society Foundations, DSS will host a summit that will engage our leadership staff, advocates, clients, and other city agencies to develop systemic solutions to racial disparities across our programs. DSS has begun to implement comprehensive intersectional anti-oppression training curriculum. Starting today, all new hires will receive a week-long series of trainings covering topics such as the drivers of poverty and homelessness, including racism, income inequality, gender, sexual orientation, and disability, as well as a history of social services. The curriculum also includes best practices for addressing the needs of diverse and marginalized populations, including intimate partner violence information, LGBTQI best practices, serving people with disabilities, mental health first aid, and equal employment opportunity. Previously, some of these trainings were optional or offered only periodically. Transitioning to a compressed week-long curriculum sets the tone for our agency's culture at onboarding and allows all new hires to reflect on the intersectionality of the client experience. The agency is also developing on trauma, training on trauma-informed services uh, delivery for all clients, as is reflected in some of the pieces of legislation. Together with the NYPD Commissioner, we're taking the following actions. DSS has developed that protocol I referred to earlier for determining appropriate instances in which HRA peace officers or HRA centers should seek the assistance of the NYPD. The NYPD has developed a protocol to deploy an NYPD supervisor to be part of the NYPD response team for HRA assistance requests. Control of an incident will be transferred to the NYPD when the NYPD arrives at an HRA center. I welcome your further comments and recommendations at this hearing, as well as in the negotiations regarding all of the various legislative proposals so that we can further improve both our ongoing policy reforms and our new initiatives. There are many common sense ideas in these uh, pieces of legislation. The reforms that we have been implementing over the last five years are common sense ideas. 
the experience that Ms. Headley tells us we must bring to bear more common sense. But I want to make sure as we proceed that all of this is dealt with rather than as separate initiatives, but one comprehensive approach. Finally, for context, I think it's also important to consider where we began in 2014 and the changes we've already made and the role of the unions and our workforce in making those changes. Given the major reforms that we made five years ago, it's sometimes easy to forget the major impact on the client experience that each reform has had at the same time as reflecting on the experience of Ms. Headley, indicating and painfully illustrating how much further we have to go. Consider, for example, these policies that we changed to benefit clients. Clients used to have to work off their benefits in the work experience or WEP program at city and not-for-profit agencies. We eliminated the WEP program and replaced it with education and training programs to help clients move forward on a career pathway. Thank you, safety net activists and others. Participation in four-year college was not permissible employment activity for our clients. We successfully advocated for a change in state law to permit clients to obtain college degrees to greatly enhance their ability to earn a living wage. Clients were subjected to punitive sanctions for missing WEP assignments, and they received appointments at something called the Intensive Services Center Number 71. And if they missed those appointments, the entire family would be denied assistance. We closed Center 71. Clients used to be subjected to durational sanctions for cash assistance if they were charged with violating a program rule. We successfully advocated for a change in state law as applied to New York City only to give clients the chance to cure a violation and advert a state durational sanction. At the same time, we also advocated and successfully reduced the state sanction period for SNAP food stamps. Clients used to be subjected to churning due to unnecessary case closings, which required clients to request state fair hearings to reopen their case. We put in place new protocols to prevent unnecessary case closings, and state hearing challenges by clients have decreased by more than 47% over the last five years. Again, that's client, client complaints resulting in fair hearings have decreased by 47%. Clients used to be forced to apply for cash assistance excuse me, used to reapply for cash assistance if they failed to return mail questionnaires or submit requested documentation. We now make it easier for clients to continue their assistance if they submit what is needed within 30 days of a case closing. All homeless clients used to have to travel to a single HRA job center in Queens. We stopped that practice and homeless clients can now seek assistance at a job center in their home borough. All seniors, all seniors used to have to travel to a single HRA job center in Manhattan. We changed that and now seniors can receive services at a job center in their home borough. Previously, clients only received a center ticket that did not list the purpose of their visit. In 2017, we implemented the universal receipt. The confirmation of contact with your center form was created to provide an individual who completes a job center visit or a SNAP center visit with a document that indicates the nature and date of the visit and contact. A copy of that is also available on Access HRA to clients who establish an online account. This receipt is now codified in local laws, result of legislation sponsored by the speaker. Clients with HIV used to have to wait until they were diagnosed with AIDS to receive HASA assistance. Working with Speaker Johnson, when he was a council member in Housing Works, we ended that counterproductive policy. Clients classified as able-bodied adults without dependents were limited to SNAP food stamps benefits for only three out of every 36 months if they could not find work for at least 80 hours a month because New York City refused to accept a federal waiver of this rule that every other county in the state and most other states accepted. We reversed this policy and accepted the waiver that now covers most areas of the city. Rental assistance checks used to be processed at each individual HRA job center in 2014, we streamlined the system by instituting a centralized rent arrear processing unit to ensure payments are made by the required due date. New York City Housing Authority rent payments used to be issued in paper checks. Now we've streamlined the system for making these rent payments electronically, and we're developing a similar payment system for private landlords. Using Access HRA, clients could confirm that the rent was paid to their landlords pursuant to reform now codified in st state law. In 2014, 90, 90 HRA clients per year receive reasonable accommodations because of disabilities. 
In settling the 2005 Lovely Age class action lawsuit, we began working with an expert consultant to develop tools to assess whether clients need reasonable accommodations as a result of physical or mental health disabilities. Now 46,000 clients annually receive reasonable accommodations. These significant reforms have been made possible by our staff who chose to work at HRA to help New Yorkers in need, many dedicating their entire careers to public service with an average tenure of almost 14 years. HRA's workforce is diverse as indicated by this EAO information. 59% of African American, 18% Hispanic, 15% white, 8% Asian, 70% of the workforce is made up of women. And HRA workers are represented by DC 37 union locals, 1549, 371, 2627, 1407, and 924, as well as many other unions, including CWA Local 1180, Teamsters Local 237, the Civil Services Bar Association of Local 237, Organization of Staff Analysts, the New York State Nurses Association, United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners, IBE Local 3, and Local 30 of the International Union of Operating Engineers. Our partnership with labor has been a key factor in what we have accomplished so far and will be essential to the success of the further reforms to improve client experience that I described today. Clearly, we have much more to do to improve the client experience, but these changes in social services policies that I described above show how much progress can be made by working with our staff to address client needs. Steve, is it possible to? I'm, I'm ending it right here with one plea. Great. We've talked a lot at prior hearings about benefits re-engineering, and right now, 87% of food stamp only cases transact business online only. That means you can apply, you can recertify, uh, and you never have to come to a center because you can establish an on-demand telephone appointment. We had to ask for federal and state approval to set up that system for SNAP only recipients. For cash assistance recipients, we're clearly not there yet. And we're beginning the process next month of a campaign to enable clients or, or inform clients of their ability now to open a cash assistance account through Access HRA. You can do it from a smartphone, and you can begin to submit recertification applications, and you can begin to check the status of your benefits online without the need to come to an office. We're working with the state on a pilot program to begin to move the same kinds of systemic reforms for food stamps to cash so that someone like Ms. Headley could avoid having to come to our office to begin with. We ask for your help, however, with respect to one issue. In the state budget, there is a proposed cut of $120 million in our funding for uh, public benefits. That would put a tremendous, uh, a tremendously in peril, that would tremendously imperil the reforms we've already made and the kinds of reforms that I described today and the more reforms that I know we need to make with your support. I appreciate the opportunity to highlight what we're doing to address the utterly unacceptable situation that Ms. Headley uh, experienced and the kinds of experience that I have uh, heard from other clients. But I also want to highlight the work that we're doing with our unions to try to address this situation. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, Steve, I want to thank you, as always. You. Um are someone who gets it. You instinctively get it, and it's great to be able to work with someone who gets it. Uh, you are so different than previous HRA commissioners uh, and folks that did this type of work. So I am tremendously grateful uh, that you're here today. I'm grateful for our partnership. I'm grateful how you don't hesitate to acknowledge when there have been misses and when uh, things need to improve. So I just really want to start off uh, by thanking you. Um, there are many members here who have many questions, so I'm not going to uh, ask much. Um, I'm glad you highlighted the really devastating proposed cut in the state budget, $125 million on temporary assistance for needy families, TANF, and we have to fight that off between now and April 1st. It's so important for us to be able to do the work that we want to do together on further implementation or further reforms. I appreciate very much the acknowledgement 
of the different labor unions that make up the workforce at HRA, because as you said, none of these reforms would be possible if it wasn't for the cooperation and help of the workers uh, in the centers who you have to work with to actually get these reforms done. And I know that President Wells is gonna uh, testify soon uh, on some of his feedback on what needs to happen as well, and I appreciate that. I only wanna ask about one thing, and, and I don't mean to preempt uh, Councilmember Amprey Samuels, uh, because it's her bill, but I think it's one of the most important bills. You heard Jasmine Headley say it. Uh, she talked about the need for social workers, uh, how essential that is for these HRA centers, for the job centers, for the benefit centers. So um, I, I looked at your testimony, and it's fine that you uh, gave, uh, you didn't give a commitment. You talked about how many of the ideas that are being talked about through this legislation are important ideas and you're carefully reviewing them. I would love to hear though something more specific on uh, getting more social workers uh, in these centers and what your thoughts are on that. Thank you very much for your, for your kind words and I, I accept them both in the spirit of appreciating your support but also knowing that together and with the council there's much more that we need to do to, to help, uh, help our clients. Um, I, you know, as I said in the direct testimony, we're going to implement a, a, a pilot in, in, in one center in each of the five boroughs, right? We're going to move to do that now uh, because we want to test the effectiveness of the model. I think in conversations that I've had with uh, Anthony Wells, conversations that um, uh, Grace Benny and I have had together uh, with the leadership of the agency, and I know in the, in the I thought, very productive meeting that we had, uh, Council Member Ampere Samuels, um, uh, that in that conversation, and actually in conversation before then, we've talked about um, a role that social workers could play. I think that Lisa Schreibersdorp's uh, uh, testimony actually raised a very important point of not creating additional layers, and therefore we're gonna we wanted to pilot this to see how to operate this in the most effective way, so it doesn't become uh, another uh, layer that people have to get through. We saw it as for, for situations that arise in centers that previously might have resulted in the NYPD being contacted, we want the director to be involved, but we felt that by having a, a pilot to have a social worker involved in that, uh, 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 addressing the client need, that we could have a much more uh, effective impact on the, for the client and that we would learn a lot if we implemented in five places and then build upon that to see how to build it out. I respect the legislation that's been proposed and that you're looking at a systemic change. I'm simply looking at this as um, you know, the operator of the system together with, with Grace Benia. We wanna see how we can get it to work uh, and to determine what would be needed uh, to, to make it the most effective. So, when, so we hear you, we, we've, we've heard you and we, we ourselves have been looking at this and we wanna move forward with it now. When would the pilot start? Uh, we need to work out the details as we do always with our labor partners uh, and then we will move forward with it um, very expeditiously. It's something we're very interested in seeing whether it works. I don't want to preempt uh, Anthony Wells' testimony today, but I know that, uh, and I don't speak for him, but in my conversations with him, I know that he's a supporter of getting social workers in these centers and seeing real value in that. So I don't, I know the details are important, but uh, one of your biggest partners, I think, comes at this supporting uh, this concept, which is a very, very good thing. Um, well, uh, Commissioner, I'm, I'm grateful you're here. I want to leave time for, for the other members. I want to thank the HRA Administrator, of course, uh, Grace, for being here uh, as well. Really grateful. And, um, you know, you said, and I don't want to uh, keep repeating it, but, uh, and I know how heartfelt your testimony was and how devastating it was for you in the aftermath of December 7th. And so I look forward to uh, hopefully implementing these changes that you testified on today, building on the success of the past, working with the safety net activists who have been crucial in this conversation. To, to get these done, get these things done, as you just said, as expeditiously and quickly as possible, so that we don't have other incidents that are, uh, of course, as um, horrendous as Jasmine Headley, but also the incidents that may not rise to that level, but still are demeaning on a daily basis 
uh, unproductive on a daily basis, disrespectful on a daily basis. We want to make sure that that doesn't happen, which means that you need the resources to be able to implement this. And the council looks forward to standing with you as a uh, ready, able, and willing partner to get that done. So again, I really appreciate you being here. I look forward to working together. And um, I'm gonna, if you wanted to say anything, that's fine, or I'm gonna turn it over to the majority leader. I appreciate your support, thank, thank you. Thank you. I wanna turn it over to the majority leader Cumbo, and then she'll turn it back over to our great chair, Steve Levin. Thank you. Just wanted to get right into it, because I know there are many members that wanna ask a lot of questions. Um, Mrs. Headley spoke at length today about the fact that she prepared, she took a day off from work, she took the whole day off, she brought clothes, toys, food, change of clothing. In your capacity with all of the changes that have been made up to this point, if someone were to ask you, could I do whatever I need to do on my lunch hour, do I have to take a day off, what would be your response at this time um, up to the point where the incident with Jasmine Headley happened. Would you advise someone with all of the measures that have been taken uh, in place, would you advise someone to take the day off to go to have their services taken care of? So uh, thank you for the uh, question, Council Member Uh One of the things that I would advise a client is to open up an account and access HRA. Uh, it is the most expedient way to find out what is happening with your case. Uh, in this particular instance, there was a miscommunication between the systems at WMS, uh, which is a state system, and the system that manages childcare. Uh, for Ms. Headley, if she had had access to her, to her case, she would have known at the point that it closed, I believe in her testimony, she said she never re received a notice. She would have had that information uh, for us to be able to help her more efficiently. So now that we know that, and we've put forward a resolution uh, surrounding that very issue, what is being done in order to systemize the communication between city and state? Because when you're a working mom, you've got to get to work, you've taken the day off, your child's not in childcare, you don't have the ability to navigate the difference between your state and system uh, systems uh, cooperating with each other in order to get the services that are needed. So what are we doing to address that sure. specific issue? That's an excellent question. And I have to tell you, as a mom of three boys, as a mom who is a mom in my 20s, I understand how overwhelming everyday life can be. Right. Uh, so that definitely is part of what brings us to this work. Immediately after we discovered this glitch in the system, we have been working with our state partners to address it. Um, I, I know that it, for the folks that are affected, were affected by the glitch, it's not any solace, but it was a very minor number. It was about 167 cases that were affected by this. We were able on the back end to make sure that those cases had their childcare open. We're consistently working with the state to make sure that we're working on, uh, on notices that are plain language and efficient for our clients. Uh, in fact, we have over 12 work groups with advocates, with, with clients that have been going on since this administration came into office to ensure that anything that is a local equivalent, equivalent to a state notice goes through these work groups. So we are doubling down on those efforts and making sure that wherever we missed a communication with the advocates that we work with, that they have a seat at the table to let us know where we need to change. Because it's a critical point, and what I want to drive home is that, particularly for all issues, but as we're focusing on this one in particular, that childcare is not interrupted while we're figuring out the bureaucracy of what should happen there. So. I want to work collectively with you all to make sure that that happens because that glitch and only 167 people, that's 167 different lives that are impacted in a trickle down way on so many levels. Now I, I also want to ask, um, from the video that we've seen, uh, several times Jasmine asked to see a supervisor. I want to see a supervisor. I want to see a supervisor. Why is it that a supervisor was never brought uh, forward in order to speak to her? Is that, is that a possibility in terms of what is the protocol when someone feels that their issue, that their case is not being handled? 
Did she have every right to have the ability to see a supervisor? Why was one not presented to her? And we want to make sure that we understand the protocols moving forward so that people entering the office clearly know that if you're not receiving appropriate care, you can ask to see a supervisor. And then second part of the question is on the back end, for the Jasmine Headleys that we never have gotten a chance to see, what is their recourse in terms of filing a complaint about how they were treated? Because if it hadn't been on the internet, we would have never known about this and it would have been business as usual. So let me just, um, first of all, Council Member, I want to thank you again for the, what I thought was the productive engagement that you have had with us to help us improve. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate your, your perspective on this. Again, from a common sense perspective, uh, we shouldn't have to have clients having to pack up everything to come to see us. Clearly. Which is the reason why we can see success beginning to take shape on the food stamp only side, where 93% of clients, or more than 90% of the clients are interacting with us by telephone, not coming in, and doing transactions like you and I might do with banking to not have to come in to apply and recertify. We have to move cash there. And then someone like Ms. Headley wouldn't have to pack up all her belongings coming and waiting to see what's gonna transpire for a type of function that could have been done online. In terms of the complaint process, and I know I took up a little bit of time for your answer by going back and amplifying uh, uh, Administrator Benio's answer, there are a number of complaint mechanisms, but I wanna go back to something I said at the beginning of the testimony. The problem here was that everything got escalated to the NYPD by our peace officers instead of following, again, what you and I would think, well, why doesn't the director get involved here instead of the police department? So that's why um, uh, Mr. Benny and I issued a directive saying that before the NYPD would be called in a situation like that, as Ms. Headley said, she was just sitting on the floor. She wasn't creating a, an immediate threat to health and safety. In a situation like that, where there's no immediate threat, the director should be involved and then the supervisor gets involved. The protocol that we would have wanted wasn't followed that day by the peace officers. We put in place a protocol to make sure that in the future, this will not happen again. There is in every center a complaint mechanism. On every uh, wall, there's a, a phone number to call for um, the Office of Constituent Affairs. Uh, that office handles uh, uh, complaints and processes them. We get, uh, we, we get involved at, at our level uh, when things uh, are, uh, become systemic complaints. And uh, this incident, of course, makes us take another look at, at whether we can improve. And I think the bill that the speakers got on the, uh, got on the calendar today is one that we wanna look and see how we can build upon what we're doing uh, to take what we're doing uh, into, into consideration with what happened. So there is a complaint mechanism. I think the other issue is fair hearings. For years, the agency used to say, just go to a fair hearing. We don't think that that's a great uh, response and that we should try to resolve things. And the reason why we've been able to cut down fair hearings by about 47% in addition to the policy changes is we've set processes in place to try to avoid cases being closed unnecessarily, and that's what's resulted in the, in the reduction in fair hearings. But obviously, we, there's more we need to do. It would seem that with all of the work that you've done to reduce the amount of people that are coming into an office, that that would free up your staff to be able to provide superb, comprehensive service to everyone that's coming in now that there are so many people that are not coming in for services. Why if so many people are being serviced on the telephone, and I would add that as part of the testimony that we heard, and it's usually a discrepancy we hear, which, and I hope you'll take it in a healthy way, is that we have in our mind something that's happening, and then when people come forward, they're saying, you can't reach HRA staff. They don't call back. They're avoiding my phone call. So it's this, it's this, it's this thing where you're inspired, but at the same time you're disappointed because it's like, oh, that sounds great, but then someone's saying it's not happening. Yeah, I'm both inspired and disappointed every day in my job, so I totally understand what you're saying. I do think, though, that it's important to separate out the processes that we're talking about because they really have a big client impact. If you don't have a cash assistance case and you have a food stamp only case, 
The total food stamp caseload is 1.6 million people nearly. The cash assistance caseload is about 360,000 people. Hmm. So we have people that have only food stamps. We were able to get the federal and state waivers and approvals we needed to take business onto the telephone and take business online. We haven't been able to do that yet for cash. We're beginning that process now, uh, and we're hopeful that we'll be able to get the same kind of online telephone access systems in place for cash that we got in place for food stamps. So the world in which people are describing uh, challenges and waiting times is the world that we're trying to reform, the world in which we've got much better client experience in terms of nine, more than 90% by telephone now, 30% fewer people coming into centers. You're absolutely right that the theory, the approach, the vision is if you have fewer people coming in, there's more staff time focused on the people that need greater assistance. On the SNAP only side of the world, not people without cash assistance cases, we've been able to get the waivers, the approvals, and change the system. We're beginning that process on the cash side now with pilots that we're running in the Bronx, and beginning next month, as, as, uh, as Administrator Benina and I said, we're really gonna have an awareness campaign for clients to know that there are things they can submit online now in the cash world that they couldn't before to try to cut down exactly what you said. You said it perfectly. Cut down foot traffic, and then the people that are there can focus more directly on the more complicated problems that might arise. And just two just more questions, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues. You talked in your presentation about reasonable accommodations for those that may have mental or physical needs um, and accommodations. This whole issue began around a seat a chair, the ability to be accommodated. Do those uh, physical accommodations now simply, what are we doing about the most simple of needs which brought us here, the ability to have a mom with a stroller, with a child that's there all day, what type of accommodations can Jasmine Headley look for when she comes into your center the next time? I think what she could certainly look for if she came into our center the next time is if she determined, as I heard her say, to sit on the floor, that that wouldn't result in the NYPD coming. I think that's the most fundamental accommodation that we can offer to her. There are chairs, uh, and I think the issue to me isn't going forward whether there are chairs or not, it's whether or not people are treated with respect, and if somebody is saying, I'm sitting on the floor with my child, I, I, I'm older, but I used to have little kids, if someone says, Ugh, enough, I want to sit down on the floor with my kid, the result shouldn't be the NYPD being called. That's the most fundamental change on that level. But all of the other, the retraining of the peace officers, the implicit bias training, the beginning starting today of new training for new workers to set the tone, all this is really uh, taking further reforms that we've been making, but we're really inspired by us all looking at what we've been doing for the last five years to say, what more can we do if this is what happened in one of our centers? What more can we do if this is what happened in one of our centers? And that's where the changes that I described today are really coming from, that place of saying we've made so many changes, but if people are still feeling like they're not being treated in the way that we want them to be treated, in the way our values would say they should be treated, we need to do more. And that's the changes that we're trying to put in place, which I know you are appropriately pushing us to do more, and I, I appreciate that. And finally, my last question, um, in looking at the video, which is probably the hardest thing to look at, and part of the aspect of this job that I hate is that I do have to look at the video in order to be able to better understand what happened. And everything that we're talking about and moving forward sounds like we're on the right path, but there's something like ingrained in what you're hearing in the final video is one of the um, security officers there is stating the reason why this incident had to happen as violently and as brutally as it did is because, in quotes, we can't let just one slip. This concept that Jasmine asking to see a supervisor, her demanding her rights, her speaking up for herself, could not be tolerated in that environment, and she had to be made an example of, according to this officer, about how to keep people in line. 
and it was very reminiscent of plantation life. It's very reminiscent of an overseer and those that are put in place to oversee others. If that critical aspect of people's mental thought process of how they are treating, looking at, respecting people is not changed, then all of these provisions, new programs, more staffing, more this, is not going to change the dynamic of how someone is, is treated from the moment they walk in the door. Because it, the social worker is great and we should have it, but it's almost like we shouldn't have social workers who get it, but having peace officers, police officers, staffers who are not required to hold the same level of compassion at baseline as the social worker. So, so that's really where I want to end on this because the ending of that video and hearing that is really speaks volumes to the issue. So I, I do want to address that. Um, and I know that it's difficult to imagine humanizing the folks that work at HRA after the testimony of Ms. Headley. I am uh, remorseful that I did not get a chance to apologize to her personally, not on behalf of just myself as a New Yorker uh, and a woman and a woman of color in the city, but on behalf of all of the women of color that work in our agency. I have to tell you that when we saw the Facebook video and I went and I saw it with the director, I know the director, it was gut-wrenching for us. Our chief program officer, Lisa Fitzpatrick, who's sitting here today, which, who's worked more than 30 years in the agency and worked at a center, it was gut-wrenching for us to see it. It should have never happened. There is nothing that I can sit here and say to you that excuses what happened to Ms. Headley or the language that, why you, that was used by that security officer. It is the reason that why we took such, such swift action in the agency so that we can send a message that this is unacceptable. But I can't sit here today and tell you that the women of color that work in our agency that are part of the fabric of New York City that really work their butts off to make sure that the most needy New Yorkers get what they need were not disgusted by what they, what they saw. Thank you. I appreciate your sentiment. I appreciate the work that you do on an everyday basis, but I can't recall the exact number, but according to a New York Times article, I believe, and I'll lowball it, that there were over 80 cases that resulted in NYPD being called in, and we don't have a video for those. So we're utilizing this particular hearing not to condemn, but to improve, and as we are elected leaders, we want to make sure that we leave this city and, and the experiences that people have better than when we found it. Thank you so much for your testimony, and thank you for answering the questions as honestly and as truthfully as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader. Um, thank you very much for your testimony, Administrator and Commissioner. Um, so I just uh, want to ask a few questions. Also, I want to acknowledge that we uh, have been joined by Council Members Mark Jonai, Mark Traeger, Rafael Salamanca, and Brad Lander. Um, I apologize for not acknowledging you before. Um, I'll ask a few questions and I'm going to pass it along to my colleagues. Um, uh, the first question, uh, Commissioner Banks, in your testimony um, on page three to four, you listed a number of, and five, you, you listed a number of um, Reform. And I'm sorry. I'm, excuse me. Uh, two to three, where you, where you acknowledge um, the actions that are ongoing to address the client experience, and um, you know, there's just some systemic issues here: new procedures, new levels of training, um, training for peace officers, training for staff, sensitivity training, implicit bias training. Comprehensive intersectional anti-oppression training curriculum. Um, a, uh, the hiring of, of the first chief diversity and equity officer. I guess my first question is why has it taken this long to do all of these reforms? Can I answer that question? Sure. So if you look at uh, pages seven to eight, the part of the testament that I, that I 
um, left for the record. I think it's important to, and I actually appreciate you asked that question so we can get back to exactly that point because others might be thinking the same thing. So the staff training that we put in place over the last several years includes diversity and inclusion, everybody matters, teaches how to create an environment where people feel included and at the same time understand how to manage conflict across differences. Uh, LGBTQI uh, basics training. Uh, uh, um, Introduction to disabilities, overview of disability awareness, adequate and culture, access to people with disabilities, ensuring uh, success with supervision, domestic violence, mental health uh, first aid, effects of poverty and trauma, customer service. These were our trainings that we have been doing, but we said to ourselves, okay, we've made all of these major systemic changes, undoing 20 years of social services policy that we inherited when we came in in 2014. We put in place all of these trainings that were intended to improve the client experience. And nevertheless, something happened, uh, as so many of you have said, uh, that is both, uh, you know, abhorrent, but also reflects some other underlying issues. Right. And uh, uh, Administrator Bonilla made it very clear, it was, it was appalling to all of us in leadership to see that. But we didn't just say, oh, well, that was a one-off horrible thing to see. What are the underlying issues? And I think that Council Member Kamba really uh, brought that out, which was if, if a security guard is on the tape saying, you know, this is why we had to do that, we need to do more. And that's why we rolled out these additional things on top of the things that we have been doing. Because we said commonsensically, we're not just gonna say, well, we're doing all these things, let's just keep doing all these things. We said, let's build upon what we're doing and do even more. Create, create new structures, new approaches. So if you were to identify, you know, five years into your tenure, or almost five years into your tenure, um, what the systemic barriers to the objectives that we're hoping to achieve here, what barriers would you identify? I think because I, I, I just, I will, will add to that, that or to give it some context. I mean, you hear from a lot of clients, you know, and a lot of people that have had interactions with HRA throughout their lives, that, you know, this is, these are issues that have been going on for a very long time. And it's important, I think, to be able to identify or artic articulate what are those challenges? What, what, are the, what are the deep challenges, the ingrained challenges that we're trying, that we have to really work to undo? And it's, it's difficult, painful stuff to talk about, but what are they? So if I may, uh, before the commissioner responds, as someone who was here before this administration, it's sometimes not the people. It's the fact that we have policies that are hard to deliver on. When, you have, when you're in the business of customer service, there's always going to be more to do. But when you have a 20-year history of vilifying clients that you have to change in an agency, that's also a hard thing to do. And I'll give you a recent example that I think we we'll, we'll can all relate to, the shutdown. Mm -hmm. uh, it will never make the news that our staff work through the weekend and uh, overtime on Mondays, on Monday and Tuesday, following that, to make sure that every New Yorker who, that was on SNAP got their, their February benefits, facing uh, what was coming from the federal government that the shutdown may continue. Despite that, if the shutdown had continued, there would have been an HRA employee somewhere in the city that had to tell a client, you're not gonna get your March benefits. Mm -hmm. And the headlight would have been, HRA denies SNAP benefits. So that's the business that we're in. We're in the business of having to give bad news to people who are in desperate need of good news when we don't handle all of the policies that create that bad news. Right. So the policies that we need to change are sometimes federal and state level policies which I hope that you will support us in so that our clients and our staff can have a better interaction. Always, sure. So I would just amplify that with, as you know, I, I sued the agency that I run for many, many years before I became the head of it. And I always believed the lawsuits were about the policies, not the people at the agency. And so when I became head of HRA, 
uh, everybody thought I would wipe out the entire leadership of the agency. I did not. The leadership of the agency it was is the leadership of the agency still because you know what the leadership of the agency were people that came to work at the agency to make change in people's lives, and they were need they wanted to make the changes that I wanted to make when I came, and that all of us uh, in this room wanted to make five years ago. But I think that you know Grace Benita's testimony is is important to remember. If every day you're telling somebody the only amount you get to pay your rent is four hundred dollars. The interaction between you and the person that you're telling you get $400 is not going to be a good one. Mm -hmm. That is not going to be a good interaction. But if you want us to be able to get rid of WEP, we can do that. Mm -hmm. We can stop clients from having to work off their benefits. I mean, just think of what that really meant. You can work off your benefits for free. Uh, and I know how that felt to clients, both representing them and what the reaction was when we got rid of it. We can say, we're not going to make every senior citizen go to a single center and, and, and trek into one place knowing that it's going to be hard to get there or every homeless person. We, we can make all those changes, but larger social welfare policy we have some limitations on, which is why it's so important that the council is supporting, for example, the home stability support. That will make a dramatic impact on what our workers say every day. Having said that, there's something, and I said it in my testament, I just want to say it again. We live in a world in which there is underlying structural racism. Right? That, that is built up. That's what, that's what we're confronting, not just at our agency, not just in our city, not just in our state, uh, but across our country. We're saying at a social services agency, the largest in the country, we've made major policy changes. We put in place major training programs, but it's still not enough if people feel that the treatment that they're getting is not the treatment that they want to experience. And to the credit of the unions, the unions are saying, we don't want to be in this position of having people not feel like we're treating them well because we're together with the clients. The, the, these unions have been fighting for client changes well, you know, for years. So let's take another look at what more we can do to address underlying structural racism, what more we can do to address the kinds of intersectionality that our clients come to us experiencing. And that's what these reforms that we've put together in literally six weeks are intended, or seven weeks are intended to do, which is to go much deeper than we've gone, because as deep as we've gone, it's not deep enough. I think that's reflected in the questions, for example, from Council Member Combo. We've got to go deeper to really affect the changes that our staff want to make and that we want to make. Um, with the Open Society Foundations that uh, you spoke to uh, in your testimony, that there will be a summit. Is there going to be, is that a one-time summit or is it an ongoing, um, you know, is, is it looking at producing a report? I, I think we just saw each other last week at the Foster Youth Task Force that ACS did where that's kind of this ongoing commitment, produced a, a, a report with a set of recommendations and then the legislation that we passed made everybody come back and talk about the recommendation implementation, um, which we all like. Actually, we we had a we've it's actually been pretty successful. So, um, is that a is that a one-off thing? Is going to produce recommendations, and what's the what, what what do we hope to be the outcome from that? Uh, I'm going to um, make a brief comment, and then I'm going um, to suggest that. Uh, uh, Mr. Benia can, can have a perspective as well, uh, present a perspective as well on this. Look, I think that there was an initiative that the NYPD started in having a uh, racial disparities summit, mm -hmm. and uh, Commissioner O'Neill asked me to participate in it, and I did. Uh, and uh, Open Society Foundation is supporting these efforts and agencies, and we said to ourselves, we want to be the next agency to, that has this. Uh, initiative. It's something that um, uh, Lawana Kimbrough is very much focused on helping us put together. And I think that uh, we will see how the summit uh, proceeds. Stakeholders will be there. Um, uh, Council Member Donovan was, uh, Council Member Donovan was at the uh, uh, NYPD summit in part because of his role of oversight. The NYPD, I, I'm expecting uh, that you will be uh, at, at this summit as well. 
uh, and part of, I thought, what was a good outcome from the OIPD summit was that there was a lot of focus on what was needed for that particular, to move that process forward, and we're going to be very open to do so. I'm not being, I'm not telling you, oh, we're going to have a report, we're not going to have a report. I want a process that's actually going to move us forward. We thought by bringing together uh, stakeholders and leadership and staff mm -hmm. that we can make the kind of progress we want to make. We were part of the initial meeting with the NYPD uh, with several other agencies across the city. Uh, we raised our hand first and said, let's look internally. Let's see what we can do to Im improve in this area, which we know is critical, not just for our workforce, but for the, for the city. By the way, that summit happened before this, uh, uh, what, what happened to Ms. Headley, and we said to ourselves, at that time, we want to be the next agency, and I think um, I'm uh, grateful that we are because I think it will fit into what we're trying to accomplish after what happened to Ms. Headley. Um, sorry, going back to uh, the just newer initiatives here, uh, the hiring of DSS's first chief diversity and equity officer, was that, had that been underway before this incident? Y yes, it had been. Um, uh, okay, moving over to a couple of other topics, and I'll, I'll, again, I'll try to keep this brief. Um, can, I, can I amplify the answer? Part of the beginning of the testament, I said, the incident that happened in our center with Ms. Headley, and I also added in conversations that I have had and, and uh, Mr. Arbini and, had, and, and all of us have had with clients. Mm -hmm. So we've been saying to ourselves, okay, uh, what more do we need to do to really deepen what we're trying to accomplish in the agency? So that was why that position was something that we were uh, 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 developing before the, the events of December 7th. Okay. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues actually for questions, and then I'll, I'll come back. Uh, first up, uh, Councilmember Vanessa Gibson. Thank you. Thanks, Chair Levin. And good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon, Administrator. It's uh, Good to see you, certainly under these circumstances. I appreciate your honesty, I appreciate your sympathy, your compassion, and reading through your long testimony. Um, there's a lot that has been done, and I certainly join the speaker and others in applauding HRA for recognizing all of the challenges that we face and continue to face, and are willing to not only entertain changes, but actually do them, right? Not just talking about it, but implementing changes. And working with all of our labor unions that uh, work with the workforce, I really do appreciate a lot of the things that have been done. And as you know, I've met with uh, Ms. Bonilla and her staff a number of times. My office is literally right next door to Job Center 45. I know it by heart, uh, the Concourse Job Center, and just being there for five years, I have seen a drastic improvement, both exterior as well as interior, but um, I do recognize that we still have a very, very long way to go. So alluding to what the majority leader was talking about with wait times and trying to get an understanding of why clients understand and expect that when they go in at nine o'clock, they may leave at five, um, I specifically want to ask, with a lot of the job centers varying by borough, I represent the Bronx, and the Bronx is known to have higher wait times compared to other boroughs. Now, some may ask, you represent the Bronx, why and what is it about your borough where clients have an expectation that when they go into an HRA center, they're going to be there for hours? So I'd like you to give me a greater understanding from all the things you've done, and, un and understanding the Bronx still has a lot of challenges that we're dealing with in terms of families, working families, living at poverty level, struggling, living paycheck to paycheck, but it has to be more than that. It can't just be some of the societal things we're dealing with in the Bronx that would explain why the borough has higher wait times compared to other boroughs. So the caseload is definitely higher in the Bronx. Okay, and I understand. In recognition of that, under this administration, we actually opened another center in the Bronx to address and alleviate some of the, the wait time uh, issues that you're, that you're pointing to. It, I should mention that the wait time across the city, the average is uh, 48 minutes, right? That doesn't mean much to the person that has to be there for longer than they need to. The reality is that in an attempt to make things easier for clients, even though it may sound counterintuitive to some of our clients that are here today, we really try to make sure that we are addressing issues in one day. 
And many times, more times than uh, we would like, once a client comes in, they may present with one situation, but then may need to see someone else for another, which means that our transactions for one client may be many. What we have noticed is that the majority of the transactions that we're seeing is to prevent homelessness. We are having clients come in because they need assistance with eviction proceedings, because they need assistance with housing, and that has increased the number. Uh, we are a victim of our own success, right? We, as The more that we handle an issue in the city, like housing, the more clients we're going to see. So just citing what you're talking about, if a client goes in for a SNAP or a public assistance and you learn they have another issue, they have to see a different worker to deal with rent arrears, they may have to see a different worker to deal with daycare benefits. So typically, you may not know all of the issues the client is coming in with, but the expectation, according to what happens on the ground, is you could have a client on average with a day's visit see multiple caseworkers about different issues. Is that correct? Not necessarily multiple caseworkers, but it, depending on their issue, they may need to see someone who's an expert in that area. Okay, which means that that client would have to wait um, in order to be seen. So the fact that they go in for a PA or a SNAP case, but they may have a rent arrears case, they would have to go to that unit and wait in line so they wouldn't be given priority because they were already there for another matter because there were other people that were there initially for rent arrears, so they would have to be in queue and wait until they're seen by that particular unit. It's Correct? the reason why we want to move the way of SNAP. It's the reason why we want to make sure that we're maximizing what's going on in Access HRA so that clients can apply for rent career, so they can apply for utility needs uh, through our Access HRA, uh, the Access HRA possibilities that we have, but we are in co conversations with the state to make sure that that happens. Okay, and I appreciate you raising that, and, and Chair Levin knows uh, we have gone to Albany a number of times as a former assembly member, not afraid to go to Albany again, even with cold weather, but it's really important to understand the level of oversight that OTADA has over HRA and DSS uh, departments in the entire state. So I think it's really important as you develop priorities for this legislative session, and we now have more friends in the state Senate, we really need to make sure that not only are they not putting more of a burden on us, not cutting more of our funding, but also the policy changes that we need, we have to get them done in a timely fashion. Like when you think about the PA um, assistance, I mean, it was 215 for the longest time, and these are not cognizant of everyday living in New York City. And so I understand your struggle, trust me, things get stagnant in Albany quite a bit. But I wanted to ask a last question, and Council Member Amprey Samuel and I had talked about it, and Ms. Headley mentioned it in her testimony. She talked about when she got to the HRA Center that her son was not able to go to the child waiting area because he was not potty trained. So I wanted to understand further, for clients that have small children, what does that process look like for them to access the child care accommodations at the local HRA center? In locations where we do have a child, uh, child corner or a, a children's corner, uh, if they're staffed by someone, our current policy is that you do have to be potty trained. So it's usually open for ch from children from the ages of two to I believe nine. Uh, that is the current policy. Uh, it's an opportunity to allow children who are a little bit older, who can be distracted, to be able to take advantage of that space while their parents are uh, taking care of their business with HRA or speaking to a caseworker. Okay, so there are no other accommodations we provide for any clients with children uh, younger than two? No, I think the legislation that uh, Councilmember Amper Samuels has proposed has made us take another look at how we've approached this. Mm -hmm. We've ap approached this previously, as, as Administrator Bonilla said, to try to create a way in which parents could be, uh, put their child somewhere. <clears throat> if I'm reading the legislation right, it more talks about creating a space where parents can be with their kids that's not an office type um, uh, flavor, but that has more of an ability for uh, uh, Mrs. Headley with her child to be with her child in a more child-centric kind of way. We had not been going in that direction before, and I think that's what's led to the issue about under two, over two. Mm -hmm. 
we're looking, this is actually what's a productive part of the process here. There's a piece of legislation that's proposed. It's slightly different from how we were looking at it. We want to have a, uh, conversations with you. We have space constraints. We have other constraints, but I think there's some pathway forward that we can work uh, work with you together on this. Okay, all right, I'll end. I know we have to keep moving on, and I really want to hear a testimony from the labor unions and the advocates that really do this work on the ground. Um, but I want to emphasize again the urgency. I appreciate opening a new site in the Bronx because it shouldn't be that we have a higher caseload as the only reason why it's excessively waiting you know, long waiting times in my borough. I don't accept that and I never will. Um, I want everyone to be given, you know, efficient services and I think we all have that same expectation. Um, you know, again, my office is right next door so I've seen a dramatic change but I can't tell you how many of the clients that visit next door come to us. So what we've done now because we realize the high number of cases, my district staff works with the manager and we feed off of each other. If I have legal services coming to the office, I let them know and we just really work together because at the end of the day we're serving the same population the same constituencies and we want to make sure that broadly we're providing all of the services like you said a client may come in about snap today but have a rent arrears case that they may not even know about that will hit them a few days later and then they have to go back so we're trying to do a lot of preventative work and making sure but it can only happen without cooperation on everybody's part so I know we have a lot more work to do but I do appreciate what has been done Thank you. We appreciate your partnership and I would be remiss to say that we're also constantly looking at our operations and we're hoping that we can streamline some of the needs on the rent arrear side so that folks can talk to any caseworker where they come in. But more to come on that. We're constantly working on it. We appreciate working with you and I think you know how to reach me. So anything Absolutely. that you hear, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Gibson, Councilmember Rosendahl. Um, thank you so much and thank you for your patience in staying to answer these questions from the council members. Um, I have a, just two questions about the um, workers themselves. First is, do you, um, do at the centers themselves, if you have a unit that's a SNAP unit, maybe on a different floor, it's a different type of unit, do they have regular team meetings and would the peace officer be included in those team meetings? That's a great question. Uh, we actually have uh, monthly reviews of our centers. Uh, I know that in going to those monthly reviews, those directors hold meetings with their staff to look at an, a number of things that affect the operation. So those meetings do happen. Uh, the relationship between the director and the HRA police force in each, uh, in each center has developed organically. It's one of the reasons that shortly after this incident, uh, the commissioner did put out a, a very clear directive that the directors and the HRA police have to work together during these incidents. We're working internally to uh, make sure that we have very good relationships with our HRA police. Uh, so that's also a work in progress, but I could tell you centers that I've walked through and I visit a number of them where the director and the HR police get along very well, an incident like that would not have happened. And just, um, just to clear up any confusion, when you talk about a peace officer and an HRA police officer, is that synonymous? That's one, one and the same. Okay. There are two uh, kinds of uh, security staff. There are peace officers who are members uh, who are employed uh, by directly by uh, the Department of Social Services, HRA, and then there are private contracted uh, security guards. Here, uh, there was an involvement by the private sec uh, contracted security guards, and then ultimately the uh, peace officers uh, were involved right. in the matter, and I think that Council Member Combo was referencing comments made by a security officer. Yep. Uh, towards the end of, of mm -hmm. the body one camera video, which is why it was so important that we conducted retraining for everybody, no matter what the title was. Yeah, and so do the private, um, would the private contracted worker be included in the monthly review meetings? Uh, <clears throat> generally speaking, the private contracted security guard is sort of the liaison function is played by the HRA police operations citywide. 
Um, but we'll t I hear what you're asking, and we'll certainly take a look at what you're, I mean, what you're getting at. If you want somebody to be a team member, that, that you include them in the team meeting. Understood. Understood. Um, and then similarly, as you started to think about um, you know, changes, and obviously it's comprehensive and you're doing a lot, I'm wondering if you sat down with the workers themselves at that center, at different centers, um, as well as their union reps, to say, how could this flow differently, and what do we need to make it flow differently? So that is something they were very much committed to. We visit with our staff all the time. In fact, the uh, policy that, that came out, out of this of making sure that a director and the HRA peace officers are in conversation before NYPD is called came from meetings with staff and directors. It really was a ground up type of uh, approach to the work and the more we do that, the more we get it right. So we certainly include staff and our directors and our supervisors in these types of conversations. But by way of example. And that's for uh, the private contractor as well, that they have that directive? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, but by way of example, uh, uh, Mr. Arbini and I were Friday met with a group of staff um, in one of the Bronx centers. And we were talking to them about different training experience. The training experience of you go to the center first and get a little elbow training, and then you go centrally versus you go centrally and go to the center. Mm. And reasonable minds can disagree on that. And it was very interesting to hear from relatively recent hires about the pros and cons of each approach. And that was a great opportunity. They weren't bashful uh, about <laughs> talking about their experiences, and it was very helpful and insightful. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me that you know, perhaps meeting more frequently as a team, maybe every two weeks, um, you know, would be worthwhile. Um, and it strikes me, especially because they have such disparate jobs. You know what I mean? Every, everyone in the unit is doing something maybe highly specialized and coming together and meeting together, you know, people can understand what the other person is going through when you have these team meetings and you say, so, how'd it go this week? We, we should definitely take a look. I want to say just from my own experience of going from uh, running legal aid to then running uh, HRA and uh, now DHS as well, <clears throat> there are certainly some perspectives that I've had of why don't we try this, many of which have worked, some of which haven't worked as well, and I've learned to listen to the people that are on the ground yeah. about what works. So the frequency of meetings and so forth, I'd want to defer a little bit to sure. hear from the people on the ground. But I hear your point, uh, which is making sure that, that there are those connections, which is so important. And those didn't happen here. And we've now directed them to happen, but we've also got to organically make them happen too. Okay, I appreciate, I should ask a question about my bill. Um, 1382, which is a reporting bill. Um, I'm wondering um, if you've had time to look at this particular bill, and I'm sure you report on some of the things we've asked you to report on here in terms of how you measure success um, in terms of getting the benefits out, and I'm just wanting to, I guess, confirm that you're open to um, looking at some of these additional ways to monitor um, success. And maybe also, I'm gonna add in this amazing report from the Safety Net Project. I assume you've seen this. It was released, I guess, maybe today. But um, I'm going to assume you've seen this and you've gone through it. It was built on by a previous report that they had. Um, and again, the suggestions in here are so common sense, um, which you mentioned in your testimony, but just they, they looked at ways to measure outcomes. And I'm wondering if you would consider some of their measurement tools as well. So first let me say, Helen, uh Strom, who's terrific, gave me a copy on my way in, mm -hmm. oh. uh, which I appreciated. You're uh, so smart. I'm sure you just digested yeah. it. Uh, right. Um, it's really integrated. And look, a word of praise for the safety net activists. From the beginning of my time and in, in the various positions I've had in the administration 
and with the leadership of the agency, Administrator Benia uh, uh, and others, we've had a regular engagement with them. Doesn't mean we always agree on everything, uh, but they've been a very important uh, sort of touchstone about how things are going. Uh, Administrator Benia and I have met personally with, with them over time. Uh, they were on the phone with us with a, a very helpful conference call about the shutdown uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an openness, there's a dialogue. We'll certainly take a look at what they're proposing, and I uh, have appreciated both the support and constructive criticism that they've given to us over, the, over my time in this position. It was a yes, you love everything in my bill, and it can go through easily. <laughs> Oh, uh, your bill. I, I didn't answer Back the question with the bill. bill. I went right to the report. Uh, as to the bill, I think I, I just want to reiterate something I said earlier, which is there are a lot of bills on the, on the table, and we want to make sure that we take the, the sort of going forward approach, taking into account the, the whole of the bills as opposed to sort of a piecemeal approach. There, as I said, there are some things that we're doing already or are uh, committing publicly that we're going to do that are part uh, that are that are touched on by some of the bills. We want to make sure that we build on what we're doing and don't uh, get across purposes. But I think it's a very comprehensive package of different bills. And as we've worked previously with the council, we're going to eventually get to some sort of a yes. I'll take that as yes, right? <laughs> Not necessarily on that individual, but right. but uh, but in terms of what the aim is, in terms of what the aim is. Thank you for all your work and your service to the city. Thank you. Very and much. to your workers as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. Um, okay, so I'm gonna kind of do a little bit of cleanup here, so I'm gonna be bouncing around. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, I'm gonna uh, turn it back over to Councilmember Gibson for some more questions. But um, uh, first question, just this is uh, following up on Council, one of Councilmember Gibson's questions before about uh, the childcare room. I don't quite understand why there needs to be a distinction between potty trained or non-potty trained uh, you know, as long as there's a diaper changing table, I don't, I don't really uh, see why you couldn't have um, a room where parents could be, I understand that you're maybe looking at, at adjusting that, but why parents couldn't be in the room with their kids. It, as I said, you, we had taken an approach initially of creating spaces where parents could leave their kids. One of the issues that uh, has been highlighted by by this incident mm -hmm. and by the dialogue that, again, I thought was pretty productive that we've been having, yeah. is that's actually really not. No, uh, nobody all, necessarily the, the wants to leave the, their kid some random place. They just want to be able to have uh, a. So we're yeah, taking a. So they can run around. Right, we'll take a fresh look right. at that. I mean, I have a, a two year old, and like the idea of my two year old uh, being in a waiting room uh, at an HRA center for two or three hours or more. Uh, sounds like a recipe for disaster. Right. So the idea of being with your kids as yeah. opposed to leaving your kids will take a fresh look right. at, at how to yeah. operate these yeah. things. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Administrator Bonilla, you mentioned just you talked a little bit about why Jasmine's case was closed and that there were some uh, two systems were not speaking to one another um, and it only affects a couple hundred cases, you said. Um, are you doing a top to bottom look at the at at the, the overall caseload to see I mean that can't be the only type of case where systems have to talk to one another right I mean it's it's not a maybe that's one example but um, <clears throat> I mean fundamentally Jasmine Headley didn't wasn't supposed to be there that day because um, her child care benefit wasn't supposed to be cut off and um, and so, uh, yeah, are we, are, we, are we examining whether there are other types of, or profiles of cases that might uh, see a similar glitch? We are constantly uh, managing those types of analysis with our IT team, with our state oversight. Uh, if we ever do identify any, we are certainly addressing them immediately. Uh, like I said, uh, in this particular case, it was two systems. One, one of which belongs to the state, another one to the city. Uh, as soon as we caught the 167 cases, we uh, addressed it immediately. But that is the type of action that we would take in, in, the, in types of cases like this, not just in transitional childcare, but other types of, of glitches if they exist. But. Okay. Um, speaking of transitional childcare, and I'll just keep it moving because I know it's 
We're getting close to four o'clock here. Um, uh, in 2013, uh, under the previous administration, that's why I see if I can see on your face you're trying to remember. You might not remember it because it was before your time. Um, okay. the, uh, the last peg that I remember, and this is an outdated term, we don't even call them pegs anymore, um, but the last peg, and maybe some people in the room might remember, is when we, is what, um, I think it was HRA that proposed cutting post-transitional child care. So uh, you have, you have childcare, then you have transitional childcare for a year that you're entitled to. And we, up to 2013, had another year of extended childcare called post-transitional childcare. It was about $13 million at the time that was pegged. Um, and it was the last thing the Bloomberg administration did. Um, uh, it's kind of an ACS, uh, but it's kind of an HRA. Is it something that we could take a look at in this coming year's budget? I'm not sure that, that Jasmine's, I mean, I don't think Jasmine's case would have necessarily been under post-transitional because it was during the transitional period. She was entitled to transitional. But, um, but is that something, I mean, this was, a, this was a, a benefit that used to be there up to 2013 um, that's no longer there. Uh, thank you for making it clear on the record that whatever this is, it predated me. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, I have to take a look at it. I, I need to understand w yeah. what it was, who it covered, and 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 what uh, you know what the effectiveness of it was. But I'll certainly take a look at it. Okay. Um, yeah, I would reach out to to ACS and see if it's something that they would support. Um, uh, certainly, it was something that we were opposed to cutting when it was cut. And the funding was in the HRA budget or the ACS budget. Might have been in the, I think it was in the HRA budget, but I'll get back to you on that. Okay. We can uh, talk offline. Okay. Um, okay. Um, have you seen recommendations put out by Local 237 uh, regarding reforms that they would like to see with, um, uh, with, with the peace officers? I have not. I know that uh, body-worn cameras was something that they, uh, that the local had wanted. Uh, it was something that I, that we thought was a good idea, and so we're moving ahead with it. But I'm always happy to look at uh, recommendations. We have a very, you know, very uh, active uh, labor management process with all of our locals, mm -hmm. uh, in which proposals are made and and uh, reviewed. So I'd be happy to look at whatever they're putting forward. Okay, I'm just looking at their recommendations right now, um, and, and, you know, I mean, this has been, I, I don't want to kind of rehash uh, uh, everything that went into this incident, but I think that there's a fair consensus that the actions um, by those two peace officers um, were, were inappropriate, and um, when I saw the body cam footage, which I, I did see, which has the minutes leading up to uh, the video that, that uh, we all saw publicly. Um, what I saw was uh, numerous exit ramps uh, on, on the road towards confrontation. Mm -hmm. and, um, and these were, and I saw a lot of exit ramps that, I mean, you don't have to opine on it, just what I saw, this is my opinion, my interpretation, was a lot of exit ramps that weren't taken. Uh, and, um, and that speaks to, um, uh, you know, a lack of training, in my opinion, and lo and behold, in my conversation with 237, which is the unit that represents those two peace officers, they spoke to their lack of training, and their first recommendation is lack of formal and effective training for HRA officers. HRA officers do not attend an academy, unlike every other group of special officers in the city. The new officers are provided, I'll just read it, the new officers are provided on-the-job training, which consists of them observing other officers at a particular site for one year. The newly hired officers also receive two weeks classroom training from an instructor who comes from upstate. We feel that this uh, training is inadequate to prepare the officers for a variety of difficult circumstances that they may confront or that they confront in carrying out their duties. Um, they face individuals who are, all, who are by all accounts in crisis. While in fact on a daily basis they manage to handle the different, various difficult circumstances with common sense and dignity, we feel it's not adequate substitute for regular comprehensive training and how to handle, et cetera. Um, I don't endorse all of the rest of their statement, uh, which characterizes clients, um, 
but I think the gist of training is a structural issue. Um, first off, HRA officers do not receive the same level of training that uh, ACS peace officers or DHS peace officers receive. Is that right? I don't. I don't necessarily agree with that. Let me just say for the record what training mm -hmm. they do get. Um, HRA uh, special officers, uh, that's the title, receive 167 hours of training, which includes the New York State uh, uh, Division of Criminal Justice Services requirements. Uh, that incorporates uh, HRA topics, including de-escalation training, mental health for law enforcement officer training, training in HRA policies and procedures, and on-the-job training at a job center. The onboarding process is the same as at DHS, since they all have civil service titles. Having said that, as you know, one of the first things that we announced was that we would be implementing a retraining on de-escalation, which we did. As I said, I attended each, uh, I've attended the sessions that have been held. Uh, there are 10 more officers that need to be trained. I will go to that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and that we were making this an annual mandatory training for the peace officers. So while I disagree that they didn't receive training, I agree that we need to do more training, and that's exactly why between, uh, between December and, uh, and the present, we, we implemented a, a complete retraining uh, for these peace officers. How, how many peace officers are there? Uh, just approximately 100. What would be the downside of giving them the exact same training? I, I saw the, the training institute for the, the training program for DHS peace officers at the Bedford Avenue um, shelter um, in that, you know, Lori was there. Yep. Um, you know, what's the downside? I mean, that, that's a number of, I mean, that's, it's not the police academy, but it's, it's a, you know, a, a high number of, of uh, Academy hours. Or right, that's 200, and this is 167. There's also but the, the but the difference being that I think this 167 includes on-the-job training, right? Uh, it, it does include some, but as does the uh, the the sort of situational training that THS does. But look, we're always willing to look at anything. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are some differences about that academy and and what uh, what we're expecting HRA peace officers to do, given the differences in their job responsibilities, but. Again, seven weeks in, wanted to retrain everybody, and we'll continue to look at other things you, you all from this committee and beyond the committee have had very constructive ideas for us, and I think we've been pretty transparent in not uh, saying we're the repository of all knowledge. Um, so I'm open, open to thinking about what you're asking me. Okay. Uh, the other thing that they mentioned has to do with staffing levels at HRA centers for peace officers, and I... I don't necessarily have to read all of this, but um, when, so this, this particular center at, uh, at Bergen Street took some of the volume from 500 decal when 500 decal closed. So this is a two-pronged question. There's not, not exactly, oh. and I'm gonna turn a little bit over to uh, Administrator Benio, but I think the center used to be a, snap, it was a building in which uh, it was a SNAP center and we changed it into a job center. So, I and think here's that the, it's And important. here's the reason why, we should give the reason why for the record. I think it's important to realize that the reforms that we've made on the SNAP side of the house has allowed us to really look at efficiencies. One of the things that we've been able to look at is space. So that was the, the reason why we made the changes that we did in Brooklyn, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for the decal job center where the incident happened, the access to job center space did not change all that much. It was really more an effort to respond to the lack of foot traffic on the SNAP side. And I think there's been some confusion about those two things. Right. Some of the confusion stems from the fact that the Bergen Street Center is called the Decalb Center, the yeah. Decalb Center, and the 500 Decalb was the one that was closed. That, but that, that, that's, understandable that's true. confusion. That's yeah. true. That's confusing. Um, but, 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 but just, just for the I'm record, just, can yeah. I just say for the record, the reason why we had to rearrange the footprint in Brooklyn mm -hmm. was because the landlord of the building where we had been operating the decal, decal center yeah. refused to give us an extension. While no month we, to month? Well, we couldn't get a month to we month? We couldn't get any extension while we wanted to 
uh, we wanted an extension until we were able to open the brand new Evergreen Center that I think everybody is. But that's not for another year. Uh, correct. So we had this gap, and we said, well, we have 30% fewer clients coming into SNAP centers. Let's reposition where our SNAP centers are and move the DeKalb Center to what previously was the Bergen Center. And we created, you know, the complexity is we didn't want to call it Bergen because people used to go to DeKalb. We'll think of where's DeKalb, but I get that it's on Bergen Street, not right, DeKalb Street. Right. And that has um, its own challenge. Uh, <coughs> okay. I just, but according to 237, the... 275 Bergen Street site's clientele rose from approximately 60 to 100 clients a day to approximately 3 to f 350 a day. I, I'm I assuming that uh, that you disagree with that. We we also we disagree with that, but also the security that had been at DeKalb moved to Bergen. Well, so they said the DeKalb site was manned by an HRA sergeant and three HRA officers, and in contrast, 275 with the additional clients, only has an HRA sergeant and one HRA officer. So it, it, according to them, the two people that we all saw on camera were the only two peace officers working at 275 Bergen that day, as opposed to, so that would be two, two people, uh, one a sergeant and one an officer, in contrast to 500 decal, which prior to its closing had, uh, you know, one sergeant and three officers, so four personnel. So, so I, th I think we can sort this out offline because okay. actually it's getting us to a place where I think we don't want to be. That's assuming that this matter should have been handled as a law enforcement matter. It should not have been handled as a law enforcement matter. It should be. It should have been handled as a human matter of a woman who was sitting on a floor because she was tired, because she was disgusted, because she had the challenge of being in an office with her child. That shouldn't have resulted in Understood. it being dealt with as a law enforcement matter. Understood. So I don't I mean, want to I, don't I, want I even can also get ask about where the supervisor was in this conversation. No, no. The, 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 it the does supervisor was part of this uh, incident. The supervisor, not the, not, the, not the peace officer supervisor. I mean yes, the, the peace officer supervisor was part of this. No, incident. no, I, I know. I'm, I'm saying I could also ask where the HRA supervisor was in this incident. At the time that the call was made, uh, the, super, the uh, director had not been involved in the interaction. Right. So that's a so protocol she, issue because yeah, that should have been the person that came down correct. first correct. to talk to a client correct. Uh, rather than security. But I, it does, it, it, if this is correct, and I, 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 you said you disagree with the facts of this assertion, but if it does, I mean, if, if, a, if, if the security personnel, if we're going to have some security personnel and they're better trained, they should, they should also be staffed in a way that doesn't mean, means that they're not necessarily overworked, I mean, or that it's, that it's, that it's an appropriate level of staffing. And if, if they're right, that there were four people at 500 decal and there are two people at 275, Bergen and the, the, the client level went from 60 to 100 to, three to 350 to, three to 350 a day. That's a huge, huge, just a five-fold increase. I mean, just, I'm just pointing out that it's, it's I'm not, I, don't, I in no way think that this should have been, a, or a similar situation should be a law enforcement uh, experience, but uh, at the same time, we want to make sure that staffing levels are correct. Right. I think that this is probably best left as a labor management issue between uh, us and Local 237. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, there was a dispute about the disciplinary actions that I took, uh, and I respect the, the union's um, uh, uh, role of contesting uh, actions that uh, I took as a manager in, in uh, dis the discipline of these two officers. Uh -huh. I thought it was the right thing to do, and I don't want to get into sort of the disputes about whether there were, were enough uh, uh, staffing and that, that that was a factor here. I don't believe that l this was a law enforcement matter that yep. should have been dealt with as a human being matter. Okay, so to that point then, what, what's the protocol for uh, civilian staff or you know non peace officer staff um, uh, their uh, interaction with a matter that that warrants their attention in, in in the waiting room if there's 
if there's a client who uh, is saying, look, I've, I've, I, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I, this is, something's wrong here. Uh, I, I want to speak to a supervisor. I mean, she, I saw her on the, on the body cam say, I would like to speak to a supervisor. Right. It, How, it, what's the protocol for that person be able to speak to a supervisor? She should have been able to speak to a supervisor, but the challenge of that particular incident is that it already had become a law enforcement matter, and that's why we changed the protocol, that if a client is having a, a, an issue, that the NYPD should not be called unless there's a health and safety matter. Let's not but forget, sorry, but, but be, if, if I could just finish, yeah. let's not forget that the presenting problem that made it become a law enforcement matter was that she was sitting on the floor. I don't think that a yeah, work, I, if I could just finish, sure. I don't think that a worker would have seen that as a defiant act. And I think that's what part of the challenge here was, which is why we have changed the protocol to not have matters escalate into law enforcement matters. Okay, I can only assume that she had asked to see a supervisor before the NYPD showed up. I, I, I do not want to, uh, I don't, there are matters that are under disciplinary proceedings about who asked what when, there are matters that are under litigation about who asked what, what, when. There was a request to see a supervisor. It was being um, uh, addressed, and then the matter escalated into a law enforcement matter. Okay, so, that, so it had con been conveyed. I'm just wondering what the protocol is, so. To let if, her see a supervisor. Yeah. That's the protocol. Okay, so somebody walks in, and they've been there for three hours. Something's not working right. She's starting to, you know, starting to get nervous that you, your case won't be resolved by the end of the day. You might have to take another day off of work, a new job. I mean, it's a really difficult situation. So now you say, I would like to speak to a supervisor, and, and that, that will happen? Uh, that's the protocol that was in the process of happening on that particular day. What's the process if the supervisor's not, you know, if a manager is not, uh, is not actually there that day? Right, but that's why we've, uh, Mr. Abedin and I have put in place a, a protocol that makes it clear that if there are client issues, the director or the deputy director should be involved. And as we've indicated at the five pilot centers, we're gonna add social worker staffing to see if all of this can uh, create new models for us to approach these kinds of things that clients uh, uh, raise with us because it's, a, uh, uh, it's uh, understandable that issues may arise from time to time. Okay, so the social workers are, are a pilot right now. We've announced today that we're going to be implementing this pilot. It's gonna require a uh, conversation with Local 371, and then we'll move forward as expeditiously as, as possible. Okay, um, and have you determined what would uh, be required in terms of resources to, to implement it across the system? We're gonna, the, the reason why we wanna implement it as a pilot is to see what's effective. And then depending on what's effective, we'll make a determination about uh, what the scale uh, that would be needed would be. Okay, so depending on what the scale is, would you be willing to um, commit to a, 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 a new needs request for social workers to go throughout the system? Depending on, but I, I don't wanna say what that exactly is in terms of how big, the, how big a, a workforce that needs to be, but a scale, a scaled up uh, um, uh, allocation. Obviously, I have the, we had the commitment at the agency to implement this pilot, and we have the support uh, to move forward with it. And let's see what the results are, and then we'll determine whether- How long is the pilot for? It's been announced for the first time today. Okay, because it's February 4th. Um, yes. Preliminary budget is coming out in a couple of days. We're going to have hearings, then we're going to have an exec budget, then we're going to have adoption sometime in the middle of June. Can we try to see if that can be uh, a scaled up version by adoption, or is that too quick? I'm just, I don't know. Scaled up or a pilot? Scaled up. I mean, pilot's happening, so. Uh, well, no, the pilot, let's make the record clear. I'm justifying under oath. I announced the pilot today. 
I'm going to have a sit down with that um, partner over there, uh, Anthony Wells, to work through how it's going to operate. Then we're going to have to operationalize it. Then we're going to have to hire people consistent with the civil services law. Then we're going to have to train them. Then we're going to have to put them in place. I think the next time I'm going to see you for certain is mid-March. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be ready by mid-March. I don't but think we, I'm going to have results by mid-March. But we have an executive budget hearing in mid-May, so that's all I'm saying. Um, uh, we're, and we have a full, you know, three-week nego budget negotiation that new, ne that, that, you know, we're, new, new funding can't add. We're clearly committed to do this. Yep. And we're going to make it work because we think it's the right for our staff and for our clients. Okay. Um, just a couple questions about wait times here. Um, uh, the survey that was put out by um, Safety Net Project today shows wait times that are, according to their client surveys, much, much higher. Um, average of 3.13 hours for job centers, which is down, you know, so duly acknowledged, down from 3.5 in 2014, and 2.78 for SNAP centers. But obviously that is um, um, very different from uh, HRA's numbers. So just wondering why would that be? I have to look at the report, but again, in the SNAP world, 87% uh, of the research of the applications and recertifications yeah, are online. happening online. Yeah, but uh, there's still 13. I mean, I'm just. I have to have to look at the report, uh, okay. and but that's the whole reason why we've been trying to do what we've been doing on the SNAP only side, which is move to telephone interviews. Now, uh, more than 90% of the interviews are by telephone, uh, and all of this is to avoid people coming into the offices. And we'll have to take a look at the report. As I said, I spoke very highly, and I continue to, will continue to speak highly of the safety net activist um, uh, group. And we will look at the report and sit down with them and see what we can learn from it uh, to make reforms going forward. Okay. I just want to highlight one conversation that we had with our staff just last week. One of the critical things that we need to do as an agency, as management, is really build awareness around Access HRA. More than on one occasion, we've heard from case managers who have said, you know, the minute I go out there and I tell people, you know, if you have an account, you can actually upload this document you came in for, they either leave or they're like, my goodness, I didn't know about this, right? Yeah. So we're taking that very seriously. There are mechanisms that we have right now uh, where we can bring down that wait time, which is why we're starting a campaign in March to build awareness around Access HRA. Okay, I just, just, but it's, I, I'm curious on how we're calculating wait times. When, so, uh, so Jasmine's case, she had two separate issues. She was seeing childcare, she was uh, following up on, on, on PA. Obviously they're related, they're kind of one and the same. Childcare is dependent upon PA. So was her, so that is an, as a hypothetical, um, is that case, is, is each individual wait time, is that, is, that, is that two wait times or is it one wait time for her? Right. Again, without, I want to be careful to not get in all the specific case, but well, it's, it's a real situation. Okay, Someone, but, but, but it presents a, it presents an, uh, let's, put it, let's put it in the realm of hypothetical. No, no, a I'll client, answer the question. A client no. has two cases, like the, they're, they're there for, for two separate things. Is their wait time then aggregated or is their wait time per thing? Right, in that, that case, thing, you know, in that case, she was actually there for one thing, which was the child care problem. She was seen by a, a screener, if you will, to figure out what was going on. And it was determined that she needed to see a, uh, 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 see a, uh, see a child care specialist. But I think to go back no, to the answer. I'm sorry, correct. It, just, it was determined she went to see the child care specialist. It was determined that she should see a PA specialist. No. no. She went there. She, she came in to be seen because she said, she, my case is closed, I have a problem. And then it was determined, oh, you need to see a child care specialist. Okay. So that was her, that was the experience. But I think to go back to Council Member Gibson's question, it's pretty instructive here. Someone is going to come in on a recertification face to face. We want that to not have to be something you have to come to the office. That's what we did for yeah. food stamps. I think we all agree about that. But I mean, during no, the show of hands, who agrees with that? Everybody agrees with that. You know? Right. During the face-to-face, -face, it's determined that the person's in rent arrears, right? right? Rather than have the person come back to have the rent arrears case be dealt with, we think it's wise to send them to a specialist who can try to deal with all the issues around rent arrears. So that's going to take not a single. Uh, 
appointment. Then there are other people that are going to come in for one thing, and they're going to be in and, in and out on their one thing that they're doing. And so if it's on the SNAP side, it's average of less than 30 minutes. And if it's on the, uh, on the cash side, it's... Uh, so we don't count our wait times together, even if people are there for multiple things on a day. Their wait time is, is, is broken up into how long they're waiting to see each individual. Because we're trying to actually manage how each of those processes are working and how long it's taking for, for different processes to work. Okay. Will HRA phone agents take a complaint if the wait time for a single transaction is less than two hours? Uh, they won't take up the phone. Well, another question. Infoline uh, will take complaints on a broad range of issues. I don't know. I'm not familiar with what exactly you're asking me. I can if, if somebody wants to call and say, I'm gonna, I want to make a complaint about a wait time, it was an hour and 37 minutes, would that complaint be taken uh, and logged? Uh, so as the former deputy commissioner over the Office of Constituent Affairs, we are under obligation to take absolutely every single complaint. So that would be, that would be tracked. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, a very high percentage of uh, people in the safety net project survey said that their calls to HRA were never or rarely answered. Um, it's again shows signs of improvement. In 2014, it was 86%. Now it's 64%, but that's two thirds. Um, again, I think that's exactly why we need to move the cash world onto online and on-demand interviews. Because Excellent segue. What what is the so so what what do we have to do to make that happen? So recertifications are, are going to be, that's part of the campaign that uh, Administrator Benia referred to, uh, to encourage clients to recertify online. Uh, we have a demonstration uh, a pilot running in the Bronx to show the state that applications uh, can be appropriately processed. And then we have other things that we want to do in the same way we've done for SNAP to try to uh, cut down on the need to come to the center for other kinds of things, like the face-to-face -face interviews, a whole range of different appointments that are required. And our goal is to cut down the number of appointments. Required by whom? Required by the state or by the federal government. OK, so we need state law change or state administrative change? Uh, it depends. For the ones that are the state? It, it's, some are. Some are uh, uh, procedures that, that need approval, and some are uh, laws that need to be amended. Okay. Um, are there, is there legislation put forward in the current legislative session on those matters that need to be done through legislation? Uh, the, the major issue that's before the state is the one you are working on with us, which is to uh, deal with housing stability. Uh, support, which would have the beneficial effect of eliminating the rent arrears, or, or mitigating, I should say, the rent arrears traffic, which is a big issue for people to come to centers, and also pressure on the uh, staff. So that would be a significant change for us. It would have a dramatic impact on people having to come to centers. Right, but we, you know, we have this opportunity in the current legislative session. So, um, you know, it would be good to see, it would be good to know what which which issues are dependent upon state law we, and and make sure that those are at least part of the conversation up there they may not get passed but you know we, we should be able to have we should be able to have a champion up there um, who's who's able to um, take these issues on we have a state senate with a 30 a 39 member uh, democratic body so you know one would think that that would and, and a lot of that is obviously from from the city so uh, we, would, we would hope that these issues would resonate with, with that, those caucuses. Right. I should say we have a, a very productive working relationship, uh, working relationship with OTDA. Mm -hmm. uh, and why don't we uh, set up a time to brief you on some of Great. the uh, uh, things that are beyond the ability of our working relationship with OTDA to address. Again, I think they've been a good partner with us on many issues. Okay. okay. I'll pass it over to Councilmember Gibson for further questions. I'll be quick because I know we still have more of the hearing. Um, 
Language access, I know, is something that we all are um, very um, cognizant of and prioritizing, and I don't remember who, but someone, oh, one of the attorneys referenced a client who went into a center where Spanish was her primary language, and so obviously I throw that out to make sure, especially on behalf of the Bronx, that that's something that we're very uh, aware of. And I wanted to ask uh, a number of the issues that we hear constantly about that's also in the Safety Net report is reducing documentation errors. So if you have the mobile app, um, if you go to one of the kiosks, you're given a receipt, either a, a hard receipt or you're given an email confirmation. Outside of that, when you go to the centers and you visit with a caseworker, are the clients given any sort of receipt or any documentation to uh, substantiate that they did provide it? So there are many instances where clients will tell us that the documents were lost, they were never received, someone else has them, I don't have them, et cetera, et cetera. So how are we dealing with uh, streamlining that process? So to answer the first part of your question, language access, uh, it certainly has been a priority for many years to make sure that language access is something we're addressing as an agency. Uh, it's a priority of the city, as you could see from uh, before the administration to this administration, we've added a number of languages. Our staff is trained uh, consistently on providing language access. I, I urge any advocate that's in the room to please bring this to our attention because it is something that we have been drilling down in the agency for years. Uh, on the instance of do people walk away with anything where they come in? Yes, they should. A caseworker should say, you provided the following documents to us, and they should walk, that is definitely the policy. If that is not happening, we definitely want to hear about that as well. The reason why opening up, an, and I can't, I, I know I sound like a broken record, but the reason why opening an Access HRA account is important is because whether you give it to the caseworker, whether you're uploading it, you will see what you handed in. And that is going to be like the best verification that you can have on what you handed in in the agency in the various ways that we have to submit documentation. Okay, the Bronx Cash Assistant pilot that started last July, not been a year yet, um, but you indicated in your testimony there were 14 CBOs that you're working with, so each of those CBOs has a HRA staff assigned to work at the CBO, or is that the CBO's responsibility? And I would also hope, now not knowing the 14 CBOs, but I can think of a number in my district that cover my zip codes, and hoping that they are involved because we're trying to prevent clients from going to the centers in the first place. We're trying to streamline the process, but we also have other CBOs that do a lot of this work as well. So if we can send them there, they won't have to sit at an office for hours on, on a given time. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that we know about many of our, our uh, clients is that they find resources in many, many different areas, right? One of them is definitely the CBO uh, world. Mm -hmm. The beauty of the pilot is to empower CBOs while they're working on whatever else they're doing with those, with those clients, whether it's childcare or youth development, whatever it is that they're doing, that they're like, wait a minute, do you need to apply for uh, cash assistance uh, through HRA? Let me help you with that application. Right, so that is what we're testing. What does it look like when an HRA worker doesn't need to necessarily help someone apply for cash assistance? The reality is that because those clients also need to have a face-to-face, -face, they're still walking into an HRA uh, job center. But what we have found with the pilot is that the quality of the application is better because they're doing it, A, with a trusted individual, and B, with some assistance. So that's what we're hoping to prove to the state so we could expand this pilot to the very organizations that you're probably thinking about that are not doing okay. it currently. And what's the time frame the state has given you to evaluate the pilot? We are we're still in conversations with the state. We're having a much larger conversation post this uh, this incident okay. uh, to really look comprehensively at where we really need to be more aggressive with our partnership with OTDA uh, so that we can expand some of the access on other services, not just this pilot. 
Okay, and my last question as we move on is the Local Law 175 uh, Commissioner that talks about the training for implicit bias and discrimination and cultural competency. I think a number of other agencies are also looking at, uh, as well, I think about DOE and our teachers and educators, and there's a deadline of 2020, mid-July, to do that, and I wanted to understand the content and the actual curriculum. So, as I mentioned, my office is right next door. Uh, understanding the life of what a client goes through, but also the life of what a caseworker goes through. There are many late nights I'm leaving my district office and HRA is still there and caseworkers are still there and going through the inordinate amount of cases every single day and you know I, I put this on the perspective of what we're doing with cure violence how we respond to violence from a holistic perspective and we take care of that family that's traumatized but we also take care of the worker that's also traumatized as well because it's not easy to spend eight hours of your day dealing with a number of client cases and and go home and have to return the next day. Same thing for clients too, to spend five hours of your day you know, dealing with this and you have to go back to work the next day. So again, I look at it from both perspectives because it's hard to fill both of those shoes. So my question is, in the curriculum of this training that we're doing, are we looking at it from both perspectives so we want everyone to have common decency and courtesy and serve with honor and integrity and basic respectfulness of who we are as human beings, but are we looking at it from both perspectives because I know you alluded, Commissioner, that it's not easy to deliver bad news, but it's also the delivery and how you deliver that news as well that does make a difference. So I want to understand how you're doing this implementation and what can we expect by the deadline. I, I think uh, I agree with all your concerns and all the points that you're making. Uh, the implicit bias training that we uh, announced uh, that we would be rolling out, we're moving forward expeditiously to have the appropriate uh, 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 vendor to do it. And it is very much focused on uh, the worker. Uh, for example, in just the de-escalation training that uh, I went to that we just uh, 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 rolled out for retraining for our peace officers, you know, one of the important messages, we want to give you the tools to be able to do the job uh, that we're asking you to do every day on the front lines. And so that's certainly a perspective in all the training that we're, uh, that I described in the testimony today, that our staff are on the front lines every day, uh, they're dedicated, uh, and they're also in situations that are uh, very stressful for them too, in the same way that they're very stressful for the clients. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Gibson. Um, so. Commissioner and Administrator, I just have a, a few more questions here, and then I'll let, I'll let you go. Um, first off, I want to say I, I didn't I didn't mean to imply that we should do away with um, the ability for parents to leave their children if they deem that fit in a you know as is currently practiced. I just think it should be augmented, or people should have the option of being able to stay there with their with their children, and uh, particularly children that are not necessarily potty trained. Um, and then, secondly, just as a, as a uh, follow up. While we agree and wholeheartedly support all the efforts to get as many applications and recertifications and document uploadings done online, people still want to be able to reach somebody when they call on the phone, particularly those that are not tech savvy. And the number on the, I mean, that should be a, a red flag uh, for anybody, that number in the 64% um, saying that they, you know, uh, either never or you usually can't get somebody on the phone, and that's that's a real problem. Right. We'll we'll take a look at that. Uh, we have complaint procedures. We have a number of processes. I want to understand what that's referring to, right. and see what we can do to address. Because I mean, I, I can speak for myself. Whenever I have to like, you know, call an automated service, the first thing I do is dial zero like a thousand times because I want right. to speak to an operator, uh, because uh, going right. through an automated service. Um, usually does not get me as a customer the information that I want or need. One of the things I know I, I had testified about in the last budget process was uh, our capital investment in uh, basically HRA one number uh, to combine a whole range of different ways that people contact us to try to make it more streamlined for people. Um, and we can talk more about the status of that um, uh, following the hearing. Okay. But we understand the technology changes we're trying to put in place with one number. 
is addressed to, uh, to I, think, I think, what the safety net activists are raising, but I want to take a closer look at their report, too. Okay. Um, Local Law 20 of 2018 requires DSS to display in the job centers information on how to make a complaint, requires the department to issue a tracking number to track the status of a complaint. Uh, we certainly do have the number up in every center. There is okay. a tracking number that's associated with every complaint. Okay. And people can, can, uh, can track that tracking number? There's a way for them to figure out what the status is? There is a way to, yeah, okay. to figure out the status. You type in the tracking number online and it, or you, I don't know, how, how do you track it? I would actually have to go, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to get back to you on that. I know there's a tracking number. How clients use it is something I'd have to get back to you on. Okay. Is it on the, do you know if it's on the Access HRA app or something like that? Or? It's not on the Access HRA app. Okay. We should figure out how to, you know, do that, uh, you know, a la UPS or USPS or FedEx or what have you. We'll get back to Amazon, you. Amazon, whatever. Um, uh, Office of Constituent Affairs, um, how do they, HRA's Office of Constituent Affairs, how do they receive complaints and what do they do with the complaints when they receive them? So complaints are received through InfoLine as well as, as the Office of Constituent Services. Uh, they are tracked in a separate <coughs> system. Uh, those complaints go to job centers to respond to. Sometimes they're just inquiries, they're not necessarily complaints. Um, I believe that uh, if, just to have a stat, we get about 50,000 um, inquiries uh, a week, and out of those, about 4,000 of them are questions about Medicaid. Many of those calls, about 1,000, uh, uh, many of those calls are, answer, are inquiries, so they're answered by our IVRS system. Mm -hmm. um, but that's how, that's how we track complaints. They go to the center, we work off the complaints, there's uh, a reporting mechanism and a tracking mechanism to the resolution. How, what if a complaint needs to get uh, resolved in real time or needs to be at least addressed in real time? How, how, how do clients do that? If they get a live person at InfoLine, uh, it's usually that person can go to their supervisor and it's escalated up to either a director or uh, other leaders in the program if it's an emergency. But they need to be able to get to somebody, obviously, so to re that point. Um, uh, it's my understanding that sanctions have been sus or were suspended. Um, was, that, was that subsequent to, to, to the Jas Jasmine Headley incident or no? No. The, the, we advocated for and the state passed, I think I testified to it, a law that uh, eliminated directional, uh, durational sanctions in uh, New York City. And uh, the state has recently uh, provided us with direction to uh, begin the sanction process again, but uh, without the durational sanction uh, requirement, it provides a cure provision, which is what we in legal aid and, and other groups had advocated for in the legislation. Do, do um, <coughs> so that was a temporary, um, you know, uh, reprieve from sanctions. Right, the, uh, state, the state had directed us uh, after the law passed to refrain from sanctions pending guidance about how to implement non-durational sanctions with a cure provision, and okay. we've just recently been given that directive. Do we expect an increase in the demand on HRA centers <laughs> from clientele uh, as a result of sanctions being re-implemented? I mean, we're, we've, we've, we have no WEP anymore. Uh, which was a big driver of sanctions, uh, and we think that uh, we have better programs now, and we have reasonable accommodations in a much different level than we had uh, for people with disabilities, and that was a big driver of sanctions, we thought. So I think with the number of the changes we put in place, we're, we're ready to, to implement the state's guidance. And again, I think the key is that the state law provides a cure provision, which was never there before. Mm -hmm. And we think that was a really important change, which we advocated for along with legal aid and others. Um, okay. Uh, so we've heard complaints from constituents that they have to go to a center repeatedly for the same reason, submitting the same request or being turned away due to allegedly having incorrect documentation. Later, HRA or even hearing officers are skeptical that attempts were made um, and there's no receipt given for those attempts. So can you speak to um, a, a why no receipts are given when someone has to go um, for, or someone goes to present a correct documentation, for example. They, they, they go to present the documentation, it's incorrect. There's no receipt given 
uh, for that interaction, and then um, and then they may get. Uh, um, so, as a point of clarification, are you saying we will ask for a particular document? The client may come in with the wrong document, and they mm -hmm. do not get a receipt for the wrong document. They don't get a receipt for their interaction, and so then it's so then later on, a hearing officer or other HRA staff will say, well, "We don't have a record of you coming in." They say, "No, I came in, I tried, but I had the wrong document." They should get a receipt for their visit. Uh, any visit should get a receipt. Any visit should get a receipt, as, and and they will. And once the interaction is done, the rec this receipt should be given. If that again, if that is not happening, we definitely want to hear about that. Okay. We'll, we'll communicate where we've heard that from. I mean, again, I would just to amplify uh, Mr. Benia's answer, the whole re one of the whole reasons to create the receipt system uh, or ticket system is, you know, from my life at Legal Aid and everybody's life in the room probably, client says I was there, agency says no, you weren't, but if you get a ticket, it says, yeah, I was there, and that was the, that was the one of the points of putting in place the ticketing system. Um, can you describe auto posting and the reason possible? Eliminated it. Eliminated? Yep. Okay. Okay. I, by the way, I don't mean to just roll over that. This was something that had been a huge problem with a system called auto posting was put in place that presumed that the case would close and then the worker was put in the position of having to rush to reopen it. It added a tremendous amount of uh, of work uh, for workers and a tremendous amount of harm for clients. It was one of the reasons why when we first engaged with our unions that we said, you know, these reforms are both pro-client and pro-worker, which is why create the extra work for workers to both close the case and then reopen the case. So we eliminated auto posting. Okay. Um, is and somebody then, saying that it's still in effect? Sorry? Is somebody saying it's still in effect? I'm uh, not sure, just. Okay. Uh, um, so, uh, my last uh, question is something that, uh, that uh, Jasmine had brought up in her uh, testimony, which was why it's, re why it's uh, uh, the policy to have a uh, recipient of um, benefits see different people uh, you know, for, for, for instance, in the case, in her case, I mean, as a, as a, as a hypothetical of child care and PA, why, is it, why would that require, it's one, it's one system. I mean, I can understand maybe SNAP being a different system and, um, uh, uh, but even, even that doesn't, I don't quite understand why it's, why one worker can't have uh, uh, the, uh, ability to work on a, an, an individual's entire case as opposed to going and seeing multiple people. Um, even if those wait times are, are not counted consecutively or uh, aggregated, um, it still uh, means that people have to wait for multiple appointments. I, I think, you know, when I, w I listened to her testimony very carefully in that point, and I think, you know, she essentially she was testifying in favor of a concept of, of a universal worker. Uh, that cuts across many different functions in the agency. Uh, some of those functions are specialized. Some of those functions are handled by different unions. Uh, but I listened very carefully to her testimony, and I think we'll certainly take a look at what can be done uh, with all of those issues in terms of expertise versus titles versus other things. Mm -hmm. okay. I, th th I, I listened very carefully to what she had to say. Okay. Uh, again, we hope that it would that's something that could that could have a real benefit on on client experience. Right, but I I want to I want to make sure the record yeah. is clear on what I said. There are issues around expertise, and there are issues around title, yep. and there are issues around, around representation, mm -hmm. uh, and all of those are uh, complex. But uh, we've certainly addressed a lot of complex problems over the last five years. I, sorry, I was mistaken. I do have one more question. Okay. Um, would you be in favor of having staff wear some type of identification uh, so that people know who it is that they were talking to, eliminate some confusion on the back end? Again, this is one of the uh, areas where the policy is that staff is supposed to identify themselves. Again, if that is not happening, we definitely want to hear about it. So okay. if they're having an issue with a staff member who refuses to give their name, for, for example, we want to hear about that. Right. Um, 
Okay, I mean, having a badge or a name tag of some kind, is that something that would be, is that something that would have to be negotiated with unions, or is that uh, something that HRA could implement? I think it would be good for us to take your question under advisement and leave our labor management relations to that process. Great. Um, okay, I think it's something that would, uh, that would make a lot of sense so that people can say, I was talking to Mr. Davis, and, you know, he told me X, Y, Z. As I think uh, Mr. Abinia said, the policy is to identify oneself, uh, and there are, a, a, you know, there are a range of different labor management issues involved here that will, again, take into account issues that may be raised by you or by the Safety Nets right. report, uh, Activist Report. Identify themselves if asked, or identify themselves if not asked. Usually, their names are by their desk, so they shouldn't have to be asked. Mm -hmm. uh, again, not happening. We want to hear about it. Okay. Just to emphasize that last point, so Mr. Abini and I go out to offices. One of the things that we find to be important is actually to go to people at their desk and thank them for the work they're doing on the front lines and talk to them about their experience. And I, I don't know the name of all the thousands of workers, but the name is right there and I see it. Uh, so if there are other issues that are arising so the clients don't know those names, we're going to take a look at that. Um, Thank you. Uh, I do wanted to say that, uh, you know, I, I do believe that um, uh, the vast majority of, of HRA staff out there in the centers, um, you know, are doing this because they want to help people. Um, they're professionals. Um, uh, they have a, a lot of experience. Um, and, uh, and they generally care about the clientele. Um, and in my experience, going to centers myself with clients, which I've done, um, uh, they've been treated courteously and, uh, and offered help and assistance. Um, that said, we have got to do better, and this administration has made great strides, and I commend you for that, and a lot of that's been in collaboration uh, with our union partners and, and uh, and a lot of good things have come. Um, this is one area where we still need to work hard at this. Um, I intend to be here for another two years and 10 months, 11 months. I hope you all are too. And, um, uh, and I think, um, I hope Anthony is as well. Um, and I hope that, um, I don't, not to be political, I don't, I, but I, I hope that, uh, that we have the opportunity uh, and uh, can demonstrate our commitment to making client experience better, um, uh, that people feel respected, uh, more respected, and, uh, and that ultimately we're achieving the objective that I think we all share of helping New Yorkers um, who need a helping hand get the assistance that they have a right to that they have a right to and that they deserve. So with that, Thank you. I will leave. Uh, do my colleagues have any further comments? So, so th thank you very much, and I, I just want to uh, appreciate, appreciate the acknowledgement uh, of how much we've done, but I want you and everyone to hear our commitment to do more, our commitment to do more, because uh, uh, we need to do more and we will do more. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, we are going to call up our first panel, uh, and this is a um, panel from Safety Net activist Brenda Riley, John Otrumpke, and Ebony Anderson. That is the first panel. Okay.
Whoever wants to begin, you may begin. Hello, my name is Brenda Riley. I'm a passionate, yet dedicated person with the member of the Safety Net Activists at the Urban Justice Center. The reason I'm here before you today is that I have a responsibility to raise my grandchildren who reside with me and receive HRA benefits. Our, house, our household income is limited. I'm currently experiencing the real possibility of homelessness for the first time as I speak from a home that I've lived for the past 16 years. My family and I are growing faces of marginalized poor people who can't get the need of housing subsidies and are excluded from access approval. Due to my destitute state of affairs and lack of ability to pay my rent and other bills, don't get paid. The pay Paul and forget Peter is my syndrome. I had to visit my assigned job center, which is Clinton Hill, in November or October of last year to resubmit my granddaughter's school letter and request payment from my utility. The school letter had been submitted a numerous of times, over and over again. My granddaughter, in my granddaughter's behalf, she could not attend this next meeting that I would have to go to. So she could not go due to the concerns of her school saying that she had been out too many days trying to get this resolved. Um, oh God. So I carried with me a letter from my doctor because I'm permanently disabled, um, my social security ID and my benefit card, her benefit card to try and resolve the issues at hand. And to document the needs for special accommodations. I was told by security if I was not able to be, to be online, I couldn't be processed and would have to leave. Understandably, I was in crisis, so I stood until the pain caused notable sweating, and the clients online assisted me in telling me to sit down while I could be seen by intake. In addition, I had to sit from 10 a.m. to 2.30 p.m., causing additional pain. When I left the HRA office, my last $20 had to be spent on a cab service. I tried walking two blocks to the nearest bus service, but couldn't make it. Seniors nor people with disabilities should never be treated in such a disrespectful manner. Two days later of being bedridden, I had to visit my doctor. The medication that I was taking for the pain wasn't working. Um, I began to have pains in my chest and in my back and, and my knee. I've had a re replacement knee. That's another whole story. The reason I stand before you today is I felt strongly about the mistreatment and this type of treatment has already previously, it had already previously occurred to me. Since then, I've been actively advocating to reform the way clients are being treated and wait time in HRA offices through safety net activists to hear of horror stories of mistreatment that makes my testimony small. And now the reason we are, still, we are here, because it's escalated. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to ask those who lead to request change to look at the regulations and program changes that can enhance costs to the, to the rather that to enhance costs rather than to increase in medical, housing, and other streams that increase when people in our communities are ignored until it becomes ep epidemic. In our, coming, in our coming together, we collaboratively can bring about change for mar marginalized people's lives for centuries to come. We have this opportunity, and we should take very good, well knowledge and comprehension thoughts about what we are going to do. And today, I will com commend all of you because you have given human thought 
and that's more important than anything else that will happen to another individual. I don't think anyone purposely wanted to be impoverished. Mine came as a result of my, my husband having cancer and died, and it just changed my life. Um, I just felt that um, bill number 2019-3648 3653, 3661, 3662, and 3667 are all things that need to change. The Safety Net Advocates at Urban Justice Center supports this administrative code of requests that the city and the New York and New York try to amend the current standing policies of reporting the use of force in human services. Administration offices by Alika Amphrey Samuel. Um, Adrian, and these people I want to bring uh, thought to Adrian Adams and Lori Como and others. The current standing of regulations to reporting the use of force incidents occurred in the Department of Social Service and Human Resources Administration's office is at best antiquated. At best and overall, the history has left many people harmed in humane, inhumane ways. After carefully, collaboratively in discussions, it is our hope these newly requested plans will, be, will assist clients and staff and security in the de-escalation and encourage situations to ways to deal with the state of trauma related issues that hostility between security staff and people seeking help are done with. Thank you for your encountering and allowing me to speak re regarding the treatment of clients and to have collaborative input to develop new ways for security and staff to treat people already traumatized by needing help, to be more respectful and professional while assisting people in job centers across New York City. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Riley. Thank you. Okay. Oh, please, please turn on the, uh, the red light should be on. There you go. Is, is that better? That's better. Great. So my name is John Otromke, and I'm here representing the safety net activists, uh, which are associated with the Urban Justice Center. Um, I uh, recently applied for cash assistance and food stamps with HRA when I sought shelter at the 30th Street Men's Shelter, uh, which I think used to be the part of the Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital, um, which was around May of 2017. So you have, you have my statements, um, you have my, my paper statements, which only echo what other folks have said, but uh, when I was listening to some of the other speakers, I had a couple of other ideas. Uh, which I thought that I might bring up to you. One of them is that Ms. Headley, um, I think, had proposed that what if there were an individual, um, everybody had their own unique individual uh, case manager uh, at HRA, and it, it kind of echoes something that I've thought for a while, which is that um, it might be very helpful, for example, if I had access uh, to sort of a really dedicated career counselor um, I had, uh, personally, I had been a freelance medical journalist, uh, which I still am, but I'd been uh, self-sufficient um, up until maybe sometime a couple years after a recession, so up until around 2009 or so. But after that, my business as a freelance medical journalist trailed off quite a bit, dropped by perhaps 50% or more. So that's one thing I've often thought is that if I had access to a, a personal career counselor, um, could help me become more self-sufficient and also uh, arguably serve uh, uh, as a benefit to HRA to help reduce uh, any burden I may uh, pose to HRA. Um, I know there are some career counselors at the Science, Industry, and Business Library uh, who speak there several times a week, um, but one thing that I've experienced with them is that uh, if you want to get any really valuable information out of them or valuable personal advice, they start to want to charge you money. Um, I think I was quoted $125 an hour or something by one of these career counselors, so, which unfortunately I cannot afford right now. 
Um, but the other thing that occurred to me was uh, when I was listening to some of the comments regarding um, what happened with Miss Headley, uh, it sounds to me like a lot of folks there may have been videotaping uh, the events with their phones. Um, and I know that I personally was at uh, an HRA job center, I think it's the Waverly Job Center, sometime maybe a year or so ago, uh, when there started to be kind of a dispute at the counter, um, and a lot of people sitting uh, there, in the, there in the hall began videotaping with their phones, and the staff actually started to either threaten to expel these people or actually did expel them. Um, because apparently it looks like there are some signs inside the H HRA centers that say videotaping with your phone is not allowed. Maybe no kind of videotaping is allowed. Uh, and the sign says that this uh, videotaping is not allowed, you know, for the comfort and convenience of the HRA beneficiaries uh, who are seated there. But I mean, it was the beneficiaries themselves who are doing the videotaping uh, and who seem to support being able to videotape. Um, and in fact, it was at the same center, the Waverly Job Center, where, if I understand correctly, uh, someone was convicted of rape sometime within the last couple of years of raping a beneficiary. Um, so my thought is, I mean, I, I don't know, sometimes I do wonder if maybe some of the staff are maybe a little bit paranoid about videotaping or audio taping. Um, but from my perspective, uh, maybe it would be a good thing, let them videotape. Um, let us videotape. It may even, there may even be a constitutional right to videotape inside there. So maybe the city council and HRA could impose new policies of letting people videotape if they want to, if it's right out in public, uh, in the public waiting room there. So other than that, you have some of my written comments which rather reflect what other people have said. Um, with that, I would like to thank you I hope this testimony has been helpful to the General Welfare Committee in its efforts, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon, City Council. My name is Ebony Anderson, and I'm here today as a member of the Safety Net Activist, but I'm also here today representing myself. If you could uh, pull the microphone a little bit closer. Sure. There you go. Thank you. But since there are thousands of people like me throughout New York City, I also represent the nameless and faceless masses. Those through a variety of unfortunate circumstances find themselves sitting in the reception area of an HRA job center. Many like myself wondering where it all went wrong and watching how a snowball becomes an avalanche. I've submitted written testimony for the record, but here is a summary of some of what I've experienced since entering a shelter about a year ago. On February 1st, 2018, a second and final familial domestic violence incident caused me to be kicked out of my home. After a week of sleeping on a nearly deflated air mattress at a friend's home, I was blessed to be accepted into a domestic violence shelter. I have cerebral palsy, and from what I know of the women's shelters within the city, I honestly feared going to one. March 1st of last year, I applied for public assistance for a single issue case for housing. After waiting almost three hours to be seen, the worker at the center was nice but incompetent as she told me that I did not need to be finger imaged. Less than a month later, I received a denial for failure to comply. I went back to the same center and spoke with the same worker. She assured me that this time my case would be processed properly and that for a second time I did not need finger imaging. She even went as far as to show me the screen that populated a page that said I did not to be need to be finger imaged. For my records, I said, well, that's great, but can I have a copy of that screen just in case something goes wrong? And she, she gave me the paper. I said, great. I went home and waited for my benefits. And another month later, I got a denial for the same reason. So at this point, I, ordered, I asked for a fair hearing. When you ask for a fair hearing, as we all know, HRA requires the mandatory dispute resolution appointment, which I appeared to. I went there and I sat with the supervisor and gave him my proof of what I had been told. It was completely ignored. He went to the director and she completely ignored it. And all I was told was you have to come back tomorrow to reapply. And next time, make sure you comply with HRA regulations as if it was, as if it was my idea not to comply. Finally, after three months, the following day I went to 
a different job center, and I was able to actually open a case by June of 2018. In at the end of June 2018, I finally received my housing voucher, which was five months into my six-month allotted stay at the shelter. I am still currently at that shelter, but I am only there because I have had to fight tooth and nail for extensions so HRA could be accountable for the mistakes that they made that caused me to sit there and wait. During this hearing, I heard a lot of things that made a lot of sense. I came in here saying, you know, HRA is the worst and nobody cares about you. But I've heard another side, and after some reflection, I think that perhaps HRA workers, they require some sort of help as well. I know social workers and therapists usually see social workers and therapists because they come across a lot of trauma in their daily lives, and they need some way to lift it off of them. I would suggest that perhaps there be a way for HRA workers who have to deal with clients day in and day out at the centers, receive some sort of care to make sure that they are in the proper mental state to deal with people in traumatizing situations. I support the legislation today and I appreciate that you're taking the time out to address these issues. However, I do have some concerns. For example, I have a concern with the intro 1328, which requires the Department of Social Services to conduct an audit of the services at the center. I support HRA being audited on its services. However, if HRA is the agency that is conducting the audit, they are more likely to be kinder to themselves than be more critical. So I think that there should be some outside agency to monitor, if not at all, totally conduct the audits. Additionally, I believe the city must attend to the fact that landlords are still not accepting city vouchers. This is still a major issue. I thank you for allowing me to share my story and to put at least one more name and one more face to the masses. I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for this testimony. I'm just looking at your written testimony. Um, you speak a little bit in your written testimony about the voucher Yes. Uh, saga? Yes. Uh, uh, are you in the permanent apartment yet? Not as of yet. I have a current application pending, and prayerfully it will go through by the end of this week. The end of this week? Yes. Amazing. Um, feel free to reach out to my office if it does not, if there's another snag, because okay. I, looking at it, you've, it's hit a lot of snags. None of them are right. your fault. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, but uh, we want to make sure that you are in permanent housing and, and, uh, and back in a, in, a, in, a safe, in a safe environment. Thank you for that. Thank you. And uh, Council, uh, Majority Leader Combo wants to add something. I want to thank all of you for your testimony, but I do want to thank you um, in particular because with what you are dealing with, for you to be here today and for you to take the time out to type up your testimony, to come up with ideas, to come up with solutions, and even to see it in yourself to put the employees of HRA before your own situation and the own set of issues that you're dealing with shows that you have a really big heart and a really depth of your soul to continue to be able to see the challenges of others before even yourself. So I thank you so much for your ability to still be able to see both sides of the coin um, in this particular set of circumstances. So I just want to applaud you. Thank you. Amen to that. Councilor Gibson. Thank you so much to this panel. Thank you very much for your insight, and we look forward to working with you uh, as this, uh, these pieces of legislation move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next panel, uh, uh, we have uh, Anthony Wells, president of SSEU, Local 371, and Ralph Palladino, second vice president, Local 1549 of DC 37.
I've been chosen to go first, sorry. Um, my name is uh, Ralph Palladino. I'm the second vice president, clerical administrative employees, local 1549, District Council 37. I'm here with my president, Eddie Rodriguez, who was a, um, an employee of uh, HRA and the SNAP program. Um, first, I want to say that um, we believe in local 1549 and DC 37 that um, every single client that comes in should be treated with respect and dignity. Our members in 1549, we have members who are on the, were and are on the SNAP program. We have members who are and were homeless, so we get it. Um, the bills that are in question are well intended to help clients. Um, there possibly needs to be modifications and some we kind of agree with and not, but we have to delve into that. But the central issue that we see that's a, a key is what's going on on the ground to do more preventative medicine so you don't need to have the as much oversight. Um, and that would be uh, the uh, issue of lack of staffing. The backlogs, the tension, outright hostility stem from lack of, ten, ten, of, of, of staffing. The key role in the SNAP eligibility process are the eligibility specialists. I refer you to public advocate Betsy Gottbaum's report on, entitled The Role of Eligibility Specialists. Um, it was the eligibility specialist that signed up all those people on the shutdown, Trump shutdown. That was the work that they did, working with management on that. ESs are not responsible for the problems in SNAP wait times and other issues. There are almost 25% less ESs working in HRA today than at, the, at this time four years ago. See the report that we handed out. That was our testimony. That's central. It documents this. Despite the reductions of staff, uh, supervisors have always been on our members to do more with less. And there's been issues with that that we're trying to deal with internally with administration. The public at times unfairly blames the ESs who by law must make sure all proper documentation is produced. Sometimes this is because of incorrect information provided by some CBOs. So the ESs must be the ones to tell the clients to bring back or resubmit proper documentation. The ESs must tell clients that they are not eligible when they are not eligible. This often leads to anger, verbal, and even physical abuse by clients at times who do not understand, that's it. They just don't understand, and I understand that they don't understand. I was in that place many years ago when I lived in Southern California. The front line, um, the, the, um, to decrease the, uh, the uh, tensions in the waiting rooms especially, we would suggest that, especially in the SNAP home care areas, that the frontline centers should be staffed by ESs in the rooms with the, with the clients who can navigate clients uh, to the correct areas of service. It's also critical to have bilingual interpreters who can assist clients whose English is limited in all of the HRA centers. This will help le lessen tensions and give information to people who are sitting there rather than just seeing law enforcement and no other staff there. Interpreters should be on duty for the face-to-face -face interpreting of clients. The use of the uh, phone, uh, the private contractor phone lines is not adequate, and that's all they're using. This also occurs in tips. There are some issues in tips with interpreting on the phone that are problematic that we can discuss without getting into it here. This leads to the longer waits for clients waiting for service. I refer you to the New York State Report on Social Services, chaired by the then Senator Avella, who talked about, and also the New York Immigration Coalition Survey that summarized the importance and need for face-to-face -face interpretations. So the key is lack of, of staffing. It would reduce tension, reduce overtime, and backlogs. 
and increase proper and respectful servicing. And just to say one thing about TIPS, the TIPS is no excuse to re reduce staffing because the eligibility specialists still have to deal with every single case that comes in through TIPS as if somebody was in front of them. So understand that, 25% reduction in the last four years, 25%. This is President Rodriguez who works in, the, in TIPS, or used to work, not TIPS, I'm sorry, food stamps. Can I? Good afternoon, my name is Eddie Rodriguez. I'm the president of Local 1549, which I represent eligibility specialists, level one, level two, and level three. And they're in different programs. Then then SNAP, then HASA, C Senior Works, InfoLine, and Medicaid. These eligibility do do they, they they really work hard and they're very professional worker and they do respect the clients. Today, it's important. I brought two people from SNAP that does the work. What you need to hear, the people that does the work, that see these clients every day, sometimes seven days a week. Sometimes we work overtime. We make sure the clients get their food stamps. So I would like to have these two workers, eligibility to, they should really tell you the job they do. That's what you need to hear, the people do the work. And by the way, HR does help, and I want to thank uh, Commissioner Banks. He's a great help. He is. It's one thing, he reached out to me, I reach out to him, and we do, when we come together, we do serve the client. That's what it's all about. Management and also um, the work and employee, it's, it's a teamwork. So I would like to hear, I would like to give permission, have these two workers, and really, and tell them the job they do. That's what you need to hear. Are they here? Um, oh, they're right behind me. Who wanna go first? Did you? Tip, I'll do tip first because that's as important. Um, okay, Clark, I, I, excuse they me. They need to fill out uh, speaker forms. So can it, I was not tell. Okay, so they'll fill so it out. Everybody that speaks has to fill out a form. Okay, they'll fill it out. Okay, so if, if maybe Mr. Wells wants to, to okay. speak, we'll, while, we'll, while, we'll while put the, Anthony Well. But all um, every, you know, everybody's. Which I got more senior. He does. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but sorry, before, I, I just have sure. a question for you, Mr. Rodriguez or, or Mr. Paladino. Yeah, question for you. Here's a question. The, the head count. Um, yes. What's the why? Why has it gone down by 25 percent? I don't understand. What's this has been the last uh, five years? Quite frankly, I, we don't understand. Okay. This we is do not understand. Not if there's backlogs and overtime, we don't understand. And complaints and tension, our staff and management. And tension. But is that a, is that a concern? I mean, has the, has the has the staffing line been reduced, or is it or is it? Uh, I have no clue. Or is that just attrition? It, well, well yeah, the attrition. It, people, it could be people have go uh, the attrition. People got promoted or didn't fulfill. I mean, it's it's a management thing. We're working on it. Okay. We are working on it. It's certainly something that I, I mean, obviously the administration has the panel but they, left, but, but we can we have our preliminary budget hearing next month and I'll bring it up. And it, we need more eligibility specialists. Okay. We do. Good. And they can do the work. Okay. Okay. Mr. Wells. Good afternoon. My name is Anthony Wells. I'm the president of Social Service Employees Union Local 371, also DC 37 vice president. Let um, me thank you, Chairman Levin, Majority Leader Combo, and Councilwoman Gibson and all your other colleagues who were here earlier, but you stayed, so you get special thank you from me. I'm uh, required to stay. I know, I'm I there. know, but I, I, let's, let, let's give you some credit anyway, why not? First of all, me also, I'd like to offer apologies to um, Ms. Headley for her treatment, and to anyone that's not treated the way they should be treated when they seek services from any public agency or entity, including elected officials and HRA. My union represents over 5,000 uh, HRA employees in various, various jobs. Uh, when this commissioner came aboard, he and I made one commitment, a few commitments. One we made to us together was to change the culture of HRA. In my packet, you will see a picture and a story reminding, of, reminding us of the condition of HRA offices in 2012 when there were lines outside of many offices. Okay, many offices, uh, which was outrageous both to the clients and to us. Uh, we are committed, this local particularly, and DC 37, are committed to the service of the citizens of New York. We take it very seriously. In 1965 and 1967, 
This union went on strike, not just for better benefits for our members, but for better benefits for the clients. So we understand the relationship between clients and services, and it's not acceptable at all for anybody to be, anyone to be mistreated in any center on any given day. So there have been improvements. Like I was saying earlier, Commissioner and I made a commitment that we were going to change the culture of HRA. He was going to do it from management, and we were going to do it from worker up. And I would say this to you, uh, over the last four years, we made some improvements. But as you say, there's still a way to go. I debate how long that way is, okay? And I, and I commend and thank the young sister, Ms. Anderson, for having an open mind and understanding what this process is about. Okay? No one that I represent or, or, or Mr. Rodriguez represents goes to work every day and says, let me see how I can abuse clients. Let me see how I can be nasty today. Okay? And if those individuals do exist, we need to address it, and we will. This commissioner has have taken issues, matters, uh, very seriously. I'll give you one example. We had a a, transgen a transgender client who the worker could not, could not recognize it for whatever block, not any on, on, on purpose. And this commissioner took decisive action to make sure that every client gets treated correctly. And he also understands that if you treat the workers with dignity and respect, then hopefully they will treat the clients with dignity and respect. On your bills, and I, and I have a conversation with you guys privately, <laughs> I think one thing you didn't do and you should do is talk to all the stakeholders because we can give you some perspective on the other side, one. Some of the bills are already being, uh, the, the policies are, are in effect already. I'm concerned about publication of termination notices that may, that may violate clients' rights to privacy and accessibility to their privacy because it's very important. Uh, I think if we all take a step back and, and do concrete things to make it a better experience. But let's, let's understand one thing. Going to HRA office for, for help is not going to Macy's. I tell my workers all the time, this is not Macy's. This is not, the people who we service need help. And we ought not be judgmental. We ought not act like the money is our money, because it's not, hmm. okay? It's not our money, okay? And we ought to treat people, because a lot of our members our clients now. We have people who get food stamps, we have people who live in shelters, who work every day, and understand what our clients go through. Will there be mistakes? Will there be confrontations? Yes. It's how we resolve those and how the policies are set from this administration to address those things when they happen. We all should work for them not to happen, but no one in this room can assure you that there will not be another unfortunate incident. No more that they can ensure you in this room that there won't be an incident outside in this world. And people who tell you that are not telling you the truth. What we need to work on is trying to prevent it and then address it when it's done in a fair manner and treat clients as they are. They're people, we're people. Our, our workers come from the same communities. They, they have had the same experiences. I remember going to my mother to the projects to get the cheese in the basement in laundry bags like everybody didn't know what the hell you had in the laundry bag. Everybody know the difference between a, 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 a dirty shirt and a box of cheese pushing out. Those days are gone because you know what? That stigma, because so many people worked at Verizon, had jobs. Verizon laid off 10,000 people. Do you think they all got jobs? No, they came to get services. One more thing I'm gonna add before I close. I sat in this for 20 years of Republican rule. This union stopped HRA from crea creating a bad people's center. They wanted to create the center worse than 71, that if you had any violations, they would send you to the center on East River. And this union said, we're not gonna participate in that. We're not gonna create a bad people's center. What's wrong with you, okay? so. We are, we got a long way, we got ways to go. This is a step in the right direction. I am happy with the tone at the end of the day that was done here. This is not one to pick clients against workers. Cl clients, you have advocacy groups, advocacy groups advocate. Yeah, is it perfect? No, I, I don't accept, because they tell me, I call the union, nobody ever answers the phone. I don't accept that. That means nobody, nobody's doing their job? 
No way ever. I, I'm sorry. I, I just don't believe that. I've been doing this too long. Yes, there are problems. Let's work at addressing the problems. Let's make sure that you are getting service, that workers are not being over, overwhelmed. Voicemail is, it has, to be, has to be returned. I, I'm listen, I listen very well. But that's a different, and this system, in this world now, everybody's voicemail. You call any of their offices, you get voicemail. Right. You go, you, anybody you call, any professional business now, gets, I hate, I hate voicemail. But guess what? That's where we're going. So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, in a job center or any HRA center, there are two, sentences, two, two entities. Nothing is more important, nothing is more sacred than the client-worker relationship. And this administration has to continue to encourage that, enforce it, and also try to make people when they come through the door feel like they are human. Wait times, I tell you what, wait times should be cut down. On any given day, it all depends on what's going on. If you were in the center two weeks ago, where they made all my workers, at these two, work overtime. Not going to their families at 5 o'clock, but work overtime to ensure that clients continue to get service sure. in spite of the, it, 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 the, the craziness in Washington. And for three days, we told our workers, this is what you have to do. Because we're there to service. If there's no clients, there's no us. It's not any bigger than that. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wells. And, and I do just want to acknowledge in my, in my first four years on, on this committee um, uh, the number of times that your union and, and, uh, and you testified um, uh, against uh, actions that were proposed by the previous administration. So I, I want to uh, acknowledge the good work that the unions did during that Republican rule um, to stand up to, um, uh, to bad decisions. And, and one more thing, and that people forget their purpose was to get people off of, off of services. Yeah. That was their goal, to reduce it at, on the backs of people who couldn't afford it. They used to have win rates. They used to celebrate win rates. We won 85% of our cases in the fair hearing. I said that was the craziest thing. They had foreign investigators looking under people's beds and looking for shoes and all that nonsense. This administration does not do that. Matter of fact, <laughs> they, they try and they expanded so many programs, sometimes they have overexpanded but it's all in the name of trying to provide services for people. Understood. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'll listen to you. Okay. Uh -huh. Ready? Oh. Let, uh, let me introduce you. I'm going to introduce you. Like I said, I have two people that work for SNAP. They're the front line. They do the job. I come from Food Stamp. I've been working for the agency. It's going to be 47 years, so I'm in eligibility. So I now worked in Food Stamp. Things have changed. Technology is here. We understand that. Just like Anthony says, our job is to take the community. We work very hard to make sure that the clients get their benefits. We give up. Most of my members are single parents. They have children. They have to really get other babysitters so they can come like a Saturday Sunday. So these are things that we do. We do sacrifice, and that's what we believe. Um, let me give you one of my members. Um, he's in ES2. He works in TIP 42, Mr. Clark. Hi, um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kenneth Clark. I am an eligibility specialist at um, TIPS 42 at 2500 um, Halsey Street. Um, I started out with HRA um, working in the TIPS program. Started it when the um, clients had to call us. And then it didn't, it didn't transitioned into on demand where um, the clients would um, call up, no, we would call the clients and then it would transition to on demand where the clients would call us. Um, since the transition, there was um, introduction to several software um, databases that we had to interact with um, before loading up so we can actually conduct the interview with the clients. Uh, we found, well, I found that there's been significant wait time in terms of these databases to load up so we can effectively do our job. These databases will cross-reference um, housing, um, um, social security, um, and other things just to make sure we get an accurate picture in terms of what the services the client is asking for. Um, I've also noticed that when it comes to um, translation, we were forced to um, utilize a, um, a um, 
contractor where we had to call a, um, we had to do conference calls in order to get the um, translators to translate what the clients were talking about. That um, increased um, wait times as well too because sometimes what would happen is, is that um, these um, translators are not trained eligibility specialists. So sometimes the questions that we're asking, um, it gets lost in translation and we're not getting the accurate picture or we're not getting the accurate information. So it just makes our interviews go that much longer. That increases the wait time, that frustrates the um, applicants who are looking for a speedy service. Um, and then sometimes, you know, in trying to rush and trying to get to the next call, as LGBT specialists, we are forced to um, just look at the information, not really study the information. Um, another thing is the um, indexing and the scanning of or submitting of documents. So like, in the perfect world, if everything is working perfectly, meaning that a client calls, they submitted their documents, their documents has been indexed in a timely fashion, so by the time that we, they get to us, we're able to open up the software, look at the databases, and look at the um, documents as well too. That doesn't happen in a perfect world. In my world, what ends up happening is, is I have to wait long periods of time for the databases to load, and then if I need to look at any documents, the viewer is not properly working or I can't see the documents, which causes me to defer clients on documents that they have already submitted. This can frustrate clients and this just increases the wait time. I think that if we had more eligibility specialists to help with the interviewing and also to help with the, um, the indexing, it would bring down the wait times and it would lessen the frustrations of the applicants. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the, the good work that you do every day. Thank you. Welcome. The next person is Green. She works for Home, <coughs> home Center, good which afternoon. is 45, next, to you, next door to you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Yolette Green. Um, I would first like to thank Ms. Gibson for her statement in terms of knowing that we, are, we work hard. Um, we are open to the public and which in itself is extremely challenging because we have to accept each and every person who comes in and we have to service them to the best of our ability. Mm. And sometimes it can be challenging. Okay. And sometimes it's challenging because when people come, they have um, presented documentation and a lot of times that documentation is anywhere from two to four years old. So then we have to refer them back to return with the proper documentation and update it. Although a list goes out, it's a form that goes to their home when it's time for applications, recertifications, informing them what information is needed. And we also have something that is called a periodic report, which is um, processed through the state to find out whether or not a client is continue, <laughs> continues to be eligible for the benefits that they've received. That's in interim. The periodic report is in between the recertification period. So a client has anywhere, they have, they have um, 30 days from the point of application to submit all their documentation, and they have 60 days for a recertification, which gives them plenty of time to return with the documentation. Now, a lot of times when they come in, they, they obtain a ticket, and that has been structured in order to keep order in our sites so that we know who has um, what purpose there. Each ticket ref it informs us as to which area that they are supposed to go to. And sometimes clients obtain more than one for two different services, and that causes a weight problem for them also. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to this entire panel. And I, I think it's an important conversation that we can have collectively. Oh, yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. One other thing. Um, if possible, um, is it possible that the screen that, that gives the clients information in terms of obtaining child support, if it could be structured so that it would give a listing of what, pa what documents the clients are to come to the agency with, that would assist them with 
um, not having to return to the center because they're sitting there watching the screen for the time that they're sitting there and it would give them information in order to empower them to have the proper documentation and not to repeatedly come into the center and to make notes that it must be current information. Sometimes I mean, clients come in and they will state that they cannot read, in which instance then they have to be um, taken aside with a, with a worker to explain to them what the documentation states and what it is they must return with. But if it's something that is you know, given to them step by step, a listing that they can see on the screen, that would also assist them. Thank you. Yes. May I say something on the language um, interpreters? There's a title called interpreters, a super service um, title. The interpreters not just, just, just translate, but they also translate the documents. When you call somebody on the phone, that person on the other side cannot see the document. True. Can't see the document. And by the time, time he translates back and forth, and if they, don't, if they don't understand what the worker is saying, that also takes a long time. We, you do need interpreters. There is a title again, and interpreters not just translate, but they also look at documents. So when a client come in, they can go over the document, they can explain it, and they can help them to fill it out. So that's what we need. This is what we're saying. We've been saying that for many years. Just to real quick, so we've also said that we have men, many members in all our unions who are bilingual and can use their language. And for 25 years in my local, the city says you can do it, but you pay for it. Okay. The other piece is I, I wouldn't, can't go home if I don't tell you that we clearly support the pilot project that, that HRA wants to do on social workers, and we appreciate your support on social workers. We think that program is going to be successful and needs to be expanded so it can do other duties, not just the escalation, but also address some issues that people have and they're not getting addressed, okay? Okay, let's put it as a new need to the budget. The FY20 budget. Yeah, but you know how I let you, yo, you guys talk about that. I don't know what that means. Listen, we I know, I know if there's a will to get it done, you guys in this chamber and down the hall find okay. ways to get things done. This is one that addresses immediate problem. Excellent. Okay. It's important that, you know, additional eligibility. You know, it, it takes a team. Yeah. It takes a team to do the work, take care of the community. Okay? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, next panel, Helen Strum, Wendy O'Shields, Charisma White, Ina Klein, and Jonathan Sunshine. And I apologize, folks, we're gonna um, uh, put a uh, folks on the clock from here on out just because it is after five o'clock here. Uh, and we do want, we have one more panel after this, so we wanna keep things moving. So we'll put uh, a time clock of four minutes per testimony, thank you. Yes, yes, I wanna give credit to our majority leader, Lori Cumbo, and council member, and uh, committee member, Vanessa Gibson, on their incredible dedication, uh, probably canceling meetings, canceling events, staying here, um, and, and Commissioner, and, and Commissioner uh, uh, Banks, and Administrator Bonilla, and your entire staff for staying. We greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Good afternoon. My, <coughs> excuse me, I have a little post-nasal drip. Um, my name is Wendy O'Shields, and I am a New York City welfare and homeless rights advocate working with the Urban Justice Center Safety Net Project and activist. I support intro bill uh, 2018 3440 for the HRA centers to report annually on the number of complaints made by applicants or recipients. I support 2019 3697 for HRA center oversight and much of the legislation that's been proposed. I believe these following suggestions will improve the HRA centers, staff, facilities, and recipients' experience. HRA center staff, number one, 
The addition of New York State licensed social workers in good standing with a master's degree from an accredited college or university. The HRA staff social workers can triage the audience and direct applicants or recipients to the correct locations, answer questions, de-escalate with trauma sensitivity, refer to DHS homeless shelters, drop-in centers, safe havens, faith-based beds, soup kitchens, and process for emergency food or clothing, and also offer other life-sustaining resources. Please consider a ratio of full-time social workers per HRA center needs, uh, e.g. three to four staff for an extremely busy center, two to three staff for a moderately busy center, and centers with the least traffic, one to two staff. Number two, mandate uh, HRA staff to inform street homeless or recently evicted about DHS homeless shelters, drop-in centers, safe havens, and faith-based beds, especially during code blue or code red. Three, on-site employees to wear name tags on their person identifying their first initial and last name. Four, yearly ethics class and a comprehensive exam certification upon completion. Five, set a deadline and for all present HRA employees on the job from January 1st, 2019 to complete Dr. Uh, Willie Tolliver's comprehensive HRA trauma-based training. Number six, an FDNY approved ratio of on-site staff to learn their CPR and um, NYS OSIS, OASIS um, Noxalin certification. HRA center facilities, number seven, working phone numbers for HRA centers and staff. Eight, clean common areas and bathrooms at HRA centers. Nine, signage for HRA centers outside the building with a clearly visible address in large type, in a prominent place, and possibly lit signage. 10, signage for HRA centers inside the building with a clear address, name of the center director, managers, supervisors, building manager, operations manager, HRA law enforcement, FJC, security guard supervisor, and HRA child care staff with their New York State license displayed. HRA Center Applicants and Recipients, 11. An applicant or recipient maximum visit of one hour for most HRA Center interactions. Number 12, an HRA Center receipt at the end of every um, visit listing all documents, benefits applied for, and names of all staff for service by. 13. HRA Center applicants and recipients need a way out of poverty. Consider developing a work program similar to the, eight, to the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act, CETA, 1973. HRA recipients could be mentored and thoroughly trained by many New York City agencies for professional jobs. A collaborative end goal of employment with the same training agency. This employment opportunity would be offered to recipients that successfully complete their job description over a year's time. A similar CETA program could mostly replace HRA back to work program, allowing the city to allocate millions of NYS TANF dollars to exclusive recipient considered assistance. Let the record show I'm also submitting a paper by Peter Germanis, uh, TANF is broken. The real irony is believing that it's been a success, dated January 26, 2019. His paper gives a history of 1996 U.S. Block, block Grant TANF, better known as public assistance, and how accessing life-sustaining public benefits have been blocked from eligible poor citizens. Please see my additional documentation enclosed. Thank you for considering my suggestions. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Thank mm -hmm. you. Nice to see you.
Hello, my name is Helen Strom. I'm the benefits team supervisor at the Safety Net Project, and I also work with the Safety Net activists. I want to thank the council for holding this hearing today and for all of the oversight and attention you're giving to this issue. I want to thank HRA um, for all the work that they have been doing and that they are doing to try and improve these systems. We know that they're not of their creation. However, every day that these systems continue in these matter, there are thousands of people across the city who are unable to access food and who are facing evictions because these systems don't work properly. Um, so thank you for allowing me to be here today. I wanted to, um, I submitted testimony for the record on all the different bills. I just wanted to speak to a couple of different issues that have, that came up over the course of the hearing that I thought were worth mentioning. Um, one is the ability to resolve problems and resolve complaints. Um, so as was mentioned, there is an office at HRA, um, the Office of Constituent Affairs. So if people happen to see the sign in the center and they see the number for the complaint or they are able to get through the info line and get to the Office of Constituent Affairs, in theory they are supposed to be able to submit a complaint. In practice, what we find happens far too often is when people call that number, they're told, oh, go to your center, and a complaint is never filed. I've had this happen personally um, five to ten times when I've called that office and I say, okay, I'm here with someone, their SNAP application was denied for this document, they submitted this document on that date. And the staff member says, well, I don't see it in the system, so they should go to their center. And I say, well, I, I would actually like to submit a complaint. Well, we don't see it in the system, so they need to go to the center to address that issue. So making sure that people actually are able to file complaints when they contact the agency, whether it's by the phone, through the info line, constituent affairs, and also in the center. I think there's a lot of times where folks are presenting problems in the center and they're being told to reapply or request a fair hearing still. And I think that is probably very related to some of the staffing issues that we talked about earlier in the day. Staff is working overtime, staff is working long hours, staff wants to go home. Maybe there isn't a supervisor available um, for whatever reason, but when people are presenting issues at HRA, all too often they're being told, reapply, request a fair hearing. Um, Ms. Anderson's testimony earlier, she went to a mandatory dispute resolution, an appointment where the sole purpose is to resolve an issue, and was told apply again, right? So I think, uh, and I, I actually think this is very related to staffing in the offices, and, and one thing that we would like to see um, is additional staff at the centers because, and additional staff that are able to solve problems because there continue to be many situations in which you need a person to fix a problem for you. And in those situations, there often is no one available. Um, even when you talk to someone at Constituent Affairs, they themselves often are not able to take action to resolve the issue, they forward it to the home center. But the home centers are already overloaded, which is why, as our report shows, the vast majority of calls the individual centers are not answered or returned. When we've brought this up and we've talked to staff at the centers and we've talked to HRA, it's a capacity issue. They don't have time to return calls or pick them up because there's so many people in the centers that they're trying to see. So what we'd like to see is a real commitment from HRA, from the council, from the city of New York to adequately staff these offices so that people can be served in the manner that they need to be. Because until we have enough people that are able to fix problems, and we have enough people in the offices, I don't think many of these problems are going to be resolved. Um, I think the other thing I wanna say is, with the cash pilot and the, the pilot to try and make things more accessible in the Bronx, I think that you're gonna continue to see issues because folks applying for public assistance still have to go to a ton of appointments for cash assistance, um, in order to be approved, they have to go to BEV in Brooklyn. They have to go to the Office of Child Support Enforcement. They have to go to all of these work appointments. They have to, like, there's so many different appointments and they still have to do an in-person interview at the center. So I think consolidating as much into one appointment um, and I think also just trying to make sure that there are people that you can talk to. Like, the procedure was already that Jasmine Headley should have spoken to a supervisor. That was the policy in place when you have an issue. You're supposed to have access to a supervisor. But the problem was there wasn't an easily accessible supervisor for her that saw her that day, right? So I think that is at the core of the problem that we need to address. Is it my turn? Yep. Hello, my name is Charisma White. I'm a, um, a client at HRA. I've been a client for several years now. Um, I have a medical condition 
I have severe anemia, which causes me to pass out and things like that. Um, I have a care provider, which is my fiance, and we went to HRA one day because we're currently homeless in the DHS system. They kind of like went into our case, changed stuff around, so they wanted us to consolidate our case into one as a family unit. And when we went to the center to try to get it resolved, I was attacked on the elevator by a DHS peace officer and FJC security and a plain clothes officer, which I have no idea came from where or what his job description was actually. He was plain clothes. And when it was all said and done, the response I got from HRA was that these security and DHS could do what they want to people and there's nothing nobody could do. As of now, I'm still trying to get a result for how I got attacked, how I feel now going into centers and everything is just overwhelming. There needs to be a big change in that perspective. We human, we're not animals, we're not to be herded or anything like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Jonathan Sunshine. I work with the, I'm a, I work with the, the uh, safety net activists, and I'm part of the safety net, uh, the uh, overall urban justice center. I, you know, I'm more, you know, I'm a business consultant kind of. My, but the thing is that I, you know, I was listening to the testimony of the lady that uh, had, uh, the, that lady that got uh, her baby ripped away from her. But the, the, I think that first of all. What I think about this is that uh, you, if you had people to come in, you know, you had people working at at, uh, at the things that where they could have a uh, what they call, you know, like I you're you know, like I'm a peer specialist too, and with peer specialists, if you had peer specialists working within the DHS and the and the HRA and everything, all the, I mean, they had special assignments that could come in, they could hold like these little meetings to let people know what they're entitled to, what their benefits are, what their uh, rights are, before they get into, you know, before they, you know, get into the thing. I mean, right after they, right after they go through the uh, key ops and stuff like that, then they would have this before they see their workers and stuff like that, because sometimes, I've seen, you know, I've seen arguments break out over, uh, over these issues, in, in in these various centers and stuff like that. I've got, I mean, when I was young, they used to do it a lot. They, they you know, and my mom used to <laughs> didn't want to deal with the lines and all that. And that's why so eating the food and everything that they used to have, and you know, they used to do all that kind of stuff too. And now, you know. They want to cut down on the food. They want to cut down on the, you know, they want, they want to send it back to, like, the 1920s, you know? I mean, if it's left, it left up to the powers that be in Washington, then we'd be going back there. I mean, we, I thought we've been pro progressed. I mean, it's not, it's not uh, the time of, uh, you know, George Washington and all that. I mean, we had Obama, and you know, and, and Lord knows how long between George Washington and Obama, you know. So I'll just say, I'll just put it this way: if you had better, uh, it, it's got to be more respect for one another. You know, what I mean, the the the, uh, cl the clients that go into the place, they go in there, they 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 ask for dignity, they ask for respect, they ask for courtesy and kindness when they go in there to deal with these issues. They got a lot of issues 
that they have to deal with, and that the last thing they need, the last thing they need is somebody uh, saying, you know, denying them the services because they either can't speak the language or they don't have the right documents or something like that, or their documents are too old or whatever, whatever the situation. That's caused by the bureaucracy. I mean, you know, they, they, you know, a lot of people put, uh, you know, they, they're told to come in on a certain day and then. Uh, then reschedule, and that, that, that could be like four or five years down the line by the time they get to the next time they see the, this person. So they, those documents are either shredded or whatever. You know, it's old information. But they want you to have information from 20, 30 years ago when you walk in there. <laughs> so, you know, it's any wonder that a, a lot of stuff aren't really updated because a lot of the documents they need are long gone or thrown out or people moved or stuff like that. In my case, in my case, they, was, they, 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 you know, they threw out my stuff, so, you know, what, what can I say? You know what I mean? So this is where I, where I, this is the way I see it. If peer specialists would help in, in, you know, we are the safety net advocates, we could put in those things, but that's what's really needed also in addition to the things we're doing. We're, we're there to help, and we're there to help, but we can't be the ones always on the front lines. We have to have other organizations come in and help us, and other services and products, you know, other services come in along with us. So that's what we're asking from the, uh, you know, from the council here. And we thank you for our time, for your time and effort. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sunshine. Nice to see you. I want to thank this panel very much. Uh, thank you for the good work that you're doing. Um, and um, uh, we look forward to working with all of you as these pieces of legislation move forward um, and on into the future. Thank you. Uh, next and final panel, uh, Tawaki Kamatsu, uh, Rakiba Fatima, Basir. Kelly, um, yes, sorry. Scott Harkins, sorry Hutchins, sorry Scott. And Sharitza Lopez Rodriguez. And if anyone else uh, would like to testify, please sign in with the Sergeant at Arms. This will be the final panel. I guess I'll go first. Um, I'm, my name is Scott Andrew Hutchins, and I'm with Picture the Homeless. I've been with Picture the Homeless for the past six years. Uh, I've been dealing, the, the Jasmine Headley's case remind me very much of the 2012 incident where I was violently arrested at an HRA office uh, for raising my voice because I was sent by the director of my current shelter to obtain documentation explaining that because I was on unemployment at the time that I could not have my storage paid for by HRA. They refused to give me that documentation, so I raised my voice and I was arrested by about six officers. The charges were dismissed because the summons, they they charged him with disorderly conduct and put a line in the description case and Mr. Banks was given a very lengthy blog entry describing this in detail a number of years ago. Uh, I've been dealing with HRA uh, since 2005 actually because uh, I graduated from the College of Staten Island on July 2nd, 20, uh, 20, 2005 with a master's degree and 13 days later I was in the emergency room with a chronic issue. And I have to say that for the most part, the only improvement I've seen at HRA personally uh, is the computers in the, in the registration area. And even that's not that big an improvement because even though it cuts down the wait time, uh, on numerous occasions, I'll bring the printout where it's supposed to go. The person writes something on the, on the, on the, the printout uh, because the printout was wrong and acts like I'm stupid because I went where the printout told me to go and I didn't know the information that they wrote on the sheet. So that, that was an issue. Um, the past year or so, I've been trying to get a housing voucher uh, at 
the discretion of my shelter. They keep sending me back there, and there there have always been issues. Uh, I, I was I was escorted out by cops for raising my voice because they, they refused to update my address. They've been refusing to update my address. I was just in last week. Uh, the, the address that they had was still the shelter on Avenue D where I haven't been since early 2016, even though they've been brought numerous residency letters. Uh, and I've gone to numerous different workers. They've all just not updated my address, so they're sending me these denials to an address where I can no longer receive them. Um, I also was recently given a denial uh, because I failed to attend the back to work program even though they were provided with a letter by my employer. Uh, so uh, basically it's like, oh, we closed your case. So like you didn't attend back to work. You were pro private, provided with an employer letter and like they don't care. They, they, they're given the information, uh, full documentation and they just don't do what's required. And of course, in my experience, the back to work program is completely useless because I come to them with medical documentation. It says limit standing, walking, lifting, bending, pushing, and pulling. And they want me to be a parks janitor or do load trucks for Fresh Direct. And then they wonder why I'm a long term stayer in the shelter system because I'm not on my own. I've been applying for, literally applied for well over 3,000 jobs over the course of my homelessness and, and gotten interviewed for about 30. Most, most of the response I get to my resume is for the entry level marketing scam. So, and that's not even a desk job. So I, I, I'm doing the best I can on my own and they're acting like, oh, you're such a problem because you're not leaving the shelter. So, well, nobody's lifting a finger to actually help me because they see my education, they see my medical restrictions, and they say Parks Janitor, Fresh Direct. It makes no sense to me, and I really have not seen any improvement, like I said, other than the computers, but if the computers are giving you the wrong information, that's not an improvement either. So I guess, I'm sorry I didn't have written testimony this time. I you know you've seen me in here before, thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, thank you. Oh, and sorry, we're just going to also call up Julianne Williams uh, from Safety Net Activists as well as the final uh, member of the public. Sorry, to, uh, you need to turn on the light. Okay, we good. Good evening, everybody. My name is Rakiva Fatima Basia. Um, I'm a lengthy client as well as a resident of the shelter system. I'm not alone. Um, I would like to take it, turn the clock back to 1974. Some of y'all that are present up, up there are aware of my situation as well. Um, in 19, June of 1974 at the Dykeman Welfare Center, and I understand this before your time, Commissioner, um, I went to Dykeman Welfare Center, got caught in the rain with a three-week-old baby, my son, my oldest son, who is now 44. And at the time, uh, the desk used to close at 2 p.m. Uh, when I got there, I was two minutes before 2 p.m. and I was denied services. So by me requesting to speak to a supervisor at the time because I had an urgency because my then mother-in-law did not want me to stay no longer with her after her son had got killed and I carried my son and gave birth. So uh, the realtor who was holding the apartment for me at the time stated that if I didn't come with the rent and the security and broke his feet, that he was going to get the apartment to someone else. So with that urgency, I requested a supervisor. Instead of a supervisor, it was an HRA officer by the name of Rupert Bowen, and I will never forget that man's name for as long as I live. Now, Rupert Bowen came to me at the time and said, uh, ma'am, what is the problem? And I stated to him, the problem is, is that I'm about to be put out from uh, my then mother-in-law's apartment, and I have a three-week-old baby. I just gave birth. I got caught in the rain two blocks away from here now, and now I'm being told that I'm not going to be receiving services. And I and well, uh, either you leave or you you're, or you be escorted out. Of here. I said, well, sir, I have enough pampers and formula for to sit here on the weekend. I cannot leave until I. I received this uh, rent security and broke his feet. So by him hovering over me, and mind you, I'm almost 5'4", this man is six, four, six feet four inches. I, I got up to move away from him, and I moved away from him in such a way, but being that he was taller than I was, he went and took his fist, 
So I had my baby like this in my arm, three weeks old, and instead of swinging on me, he hit my son by his temple. And if you can see the expression of my three-week-old son at the time, this is a true story, okay? I was, I was violently arrested as well for it. When I saw the shock and my son's mouth was stuck, beat red, stuck. I had to shake my baby with this arm to get him out, to get a cry out. And it was then, yes, I acted violently. I grabbed the wooden chair and I commenced to beat this man for what he did to my baby. Then a number of other HRA officers came to join the attack as opposed to defusing the situation. One of them came from behind me and tripped me. There was this white woman with her four children. I will never forget her name, Mari Reverby. She had hollered them, what is wrong with y'all? She has a, she's a woman. She has a baby. She has saved my son's head. This, say this is the floor. My son's head was this much from hitting that floor and could have died. So while the 34 priests and entering the Dykeman Welfare Center and everybody was in an uproar as to how I was being treated, it was this white woman and her four kids as well as a three elderly women who tried to intercede. The police were not hearing them as well as HRA. Yes, I was arrested. Yes, they snatched my son out of my arm the same way they did Miss Jasmine Ed Headley last month excuse me, in December of 2018. So I have experienced the same type of abuse at the hands of HRA. Now turning up to 1984. 1984, I and my children, as a, re as a, a result of me being victimized in the home that I was staying with, I was violated with one of my children next to me. My other children had been in forced to care, being mistreated. So I was in the process of trying to get them and try to get housing. You don't ask a mother to look for housing while you're holding her children, you understand, hostage in the, in the, in the ACS system, and then, expect, and then expect to tell her that, well, you can't get your kids back unless you, receive, unless you obtain an apartment. How is that possible? It's like a catch-22 situation. So at that time, from 1983 uh, to 1984, the, the HRA system, and I understand this is before you Commissioner Banks, were paying $5,000 for I, seven people, to stay in a welfare hotel. Uh, at the time, it was called the Travelers. Um, I've met a lot of confrontation, not only with the staff or residents, nobody, even at HRA Supton uh, Boulevard in Jamaica, Queens, uh, Welfare Center, was trying to assist me and my family. Nobody. Okay, at the time that I asked a, a, a caseworker before me and my family was victimized and I was wrongfully incarcerated, uh, named Naomi. I have all this written down for years, for decades. I asked her, I said, ma'am, isn't there some way that you can take this $5,000? Because it seems to me the shelter system is monetarily benefiting fitting off of misfortunes of people like myself. They're not assisting me and my family to get into permanent housing. They're running me raggedly looking for it, and my health is taking a hit. Well, I don't know what to tell you, man. There was no solid answer, period. Okay that later on that night, my family and I were victimized. My, one of my children were murdered. I found in the apartment who I entrusted my kids with somebody's care while I was unwinding. I was at the welfare center, Dyke, I'm not Dykeman, but Sutton Boulevard in 1984, obtaining a check. Mind you, at the time, you used to go to the welfare center at 8 a.m. and don't come back to the, to the welfare hotel with their check and whatever bill you had to pay there for until 8 p.m. This is the, this is the, the, the extension of circumstances. And, and from what I understand now from some people that I speak to, nothing has much changed. Yes, they have updated the, the, the technology, but there's still the same mentality of staff. I'm not gonna accuse all the staff, but they're the same mentality, where sometimes you do have to go back to the welfare center repetitively with the same type of paperwork that was already submitted. 
Okay, maybe the worker's having a bad day. And to piggyback on what the other people said, yes, there needs to be some type of consideration, and this is not an indirect uh, attack on workers, but you know, because whatever personal problems they're going through, you understand, on top of the client going through, you know, there needs to be some type of area where they address their, not only their personal issues so they can function and provide better services, but also, too, the question their, 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 their drug or alcohol use. Because sometimes I feel as though many of them are under the influence. Now, now, up to date, we're talking about from 1983, I mean 74, 83, 84, now within 2019, nothing has changed. I commend the commissioner for trying to uh, a better, better HR rates. You know, he's a pro, he was a pro client once upon a time who used to represent legal aid. Right. You cannot fix something with, when you have the same individuals who are disgruntled with him and also d denying me and other people from obtaining a shelter voucher. For the time I've been home, which is eight years now, I'm still dealing with the shelter system. I've been moved from one shelter to the other, and now I'm in a shelter scatter site apartment, which is contracted with the city, DHS. I have not moved out of the shelter system. The same rules and, 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 and activity applies. Okay. This is supposed to be under su uh, supportive housing as well as under mental health. Okay. Okay? Nobody, I'm not being adequately assisted, so my thing now is that where do we draw the medium here? We have the same system from the, the, the 70s or early 80s when the homeless situation really started getting out of hand to now 2019. Yep. Where does an individual like myself receive? Where do I get, who helps me? So who adequately helps me? I, I'm happy to, if you want to uh, call my office tomorrow or send me an email. Um, I've been there already, honestly. I don't know why your worker never got back to me. I will follow up for sure. For sure. Thank you, Mr. Dapin. You got it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. You're welcome. I just want to say I'm sorry that things have been so hard for you, ma'am. And, and I can relate. I'm Kelly Grace Price from Close Rosies, and I'm an ad hoc member of Safety Net. I have been for years, not that active, but I'm very proud to call myself a member. I've been a client of HRA since 2011 when I was wrongfully, as you know my story, and Councilwoman Gibson knows, and I believe Ms. Slattery knows, um, definitely Commissioner Banks knows my story that Cy Vance threw me as an innocent person on Rikers Island as a survivor of domestic abuse and trafficking to protect the credibility of, of my batterer who was providing proffer that allowed Cy Vance to sweep through uptown Manhattan and make all those big Rico gang busts a number of years ago. And ever since then, I have been dependent on HRA to help me restore myself to the status that I enjoyed before my malicious prosecutions, unlawful detention, um, and wrongful arrests. I've made a lot of progress, thanks to Mr. Banks. Um, I know he remembers my case when Legal Aid defended me, and I'm very appreciative to his staff. I've sought solace in the HRA centers, and to be quite frank, I think I've received extra attention because Mr. Banks and his general counsel, Molly Malloy, Molly Malloy, Molly Murphy, hi. Um, met me at a safety net activist meeting at the Urban Justice Center a few years ago. I'm very proud uh, to be a client. There have been a number of occasions where things haven't gone right. For instance, just uh, Saturday I got something in the mail saying, please come in for um, an appointment on the 18th, but the letter was postmarked the 19th of January, so I'm looking forward to working that out, but luckily I have a special liaison to help me. I brought Frank Sinatra, my, ser my service dog, with me today. Mm -hmm. He's new, he's only eight months old, he's my third service dog. I'm also a survivor of the terrorist attacks on the Twin Towers, um, and I really need my service dog. But I've had a number of incidents lately where I've been just outright discriminated against by HRA workers. I, I emailed my testimony to you, um, Councilman Levin, I've also emailed it to you, Ms. Lattery, and other, uh, to Councilman Gibson. Thank you for accepting my email submissions, I don't have a printer. But I, I just wanted to emphasize how um, triggering it is for me after I've made all this progress to be met with blatant discrimination. Um, and this is not every HRA worker. I, I'm on a first name basis with, with uh, the workers in the Dykeman Center. I knew Ms. Mota, the former director. I know a lot of those workers, they live in my neighborhood of Fort George. But there was one particular worker, and I'm going to call her out very quickly. Her name is Ms. Blessing Game, 
who outright discriminated against me um, at an appointment I had on December 18th. Um, I had a very similar incident at the 16th Street Center in December um, where the worker did not want to service me because of my service dog. And um, she retaliated against me, actually. After the, the meeting at the 16th Street Center, I was supposed to go to WeCare for my annual verification that I have a disability or whatever it is. And the worker didn't give me the letter saying show up at WeCare on this date. She said to me, she was being bitter because her manager made her service me and she didn't want to because she didn't like Frank. She kept saying, I don't like pit bulls. And I kept saying, Frank is not a pit bull, Frank is a boxer. Um, but she wasn't accepting that. She said, I know pit bulls when I see one. Um, but to retaliate against me because she was forced to accommodate my needs, she told me that there were no appointments at WeCare that she could schedule, but that I would get a letter in the mail about it. But in fact, she did schedule the appointment, she just never gave me the letter. So of course then I got a letter from WeCare saying you must come in and make up this appointment. Um, these things repeat themselves consistently. Um, I, I really hope that somehow in, in your revision of these bills, because I do understand there will be some a modicum of revision of these bills, that you include that mandatory ADA, Americans for Disability Act training needs to be instituted, not just for HRA workers, but for their partners. Last week at the West Side Coalition Against Hunger, the program director threatened to call the cops and have me arrested for trespassing because of my service dog. I've, I've sent around a few emails and Helen Rosenthal is helping with this, me with this because it's in her district. Thank you for letting me testify. I know no one else is bringing up this issue and I, I appreciate your consideration. We'll definitely take that into consideration as we move forward. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Tawaki Komatsu. Um, and uh, I've testified in this, uh, well, to you many times, truthfully, unlike Mr. Banks over there. Um, I have a federal lawsuit against the city as, that I prized you about previously. My testimony today, it's not for you, it's for the judges assigned to my federal lawsuit. There's a video camera staring me straight in the face. And so for the audience's benefit and Judge Lorna Schofield, as well as Judge uh, Gabrielle Gorenstein, let me play an audio recording of a face-to-face -face conversation that I had with Stephen Banks on December 14th, 2017 in Brooklyn that I think I previously played for your benefit. The police are, are, are here. You want to speak to one of the inspectors? It's an HRA building. You have oversight. The police department is responsible for dealing with crime. We are not responsible for it. If you would like to speak to a police uh, inspector right now, I'm happy to have you talk to That's not the issue. The issue is I told HRA okay. Part 16. Okay. So right. he, he needs to move on. He's okay. just a okay. we'll we'll see each other in court. That's it. Uh, Thank you very much. That's good. You're going to jail. Thank you very much. Um, earlier today, prior to coming to this um, hearing, I talked to a disabled military veteran who resides in my building. I also testified on his behalf in this room previously. Um, I had a conversation with Mr. Banks in Brooklyn in um, August of last year in regards to having repairs made in that building by Urban Pathways, which is uh -huh. the landlord. I have specifically asked Mr. Banks repeatedly to terminate HRA's contract with Urban Pathways on the grounds that is defaulted on that contract. Um, sorry, one sec. So let me play, we'll turn this around. Here's the disabled military veteran that I had the conversation with earlier today. I'm about to go to a meeting at City Hall. They still haven't made uh, repairs in your place, right? Mm. Anyth um, but anything new besides that? So you, you still need your bathroom fixed? Yeah. Um, no, because that meeting is at 1 o'clock today, right? No. No, I mean at City Hall. So I'm going to tell them, you know, um, that, uh, yeah, you need your stuff fixed. So no one has been in contact with you about having stuff fixed? No. Oh. They just come and look at it. Okay. That's all. They don't do shit. When was the last time uh, they were there? Last week. Okay. Two weeks ago, you could say. Okay. No. But anyway, I'll catch up with you later. All right. Yeah, see you later. Um, and the last brief part of a video that I'll play for your benefit, as well as the audience, is testimony that I gave on June 19th of 2017 to the Committee on Oversight and Investigations with regards to having an Inspector General independent of HRA, outside of HRA, to essentially investigate fraud and corruption by HRA, as well as its business partners. Um, I'm here to testify in support of Ms. Crowley's bill, as well as in support of uh, the discussion um, that, well, 
what was just discussed about vendor responsibility, um, meaning New York City should only uh, receive services from vendors that are abiding by all applicable laws. Um, one of the reasons why I'm here today is because I have I actually have litigation against HRA because they've been in defiance of a New York State Administrative Law Judge's decision since September uh, 15th of 2016. I've reached out to numerous groups to try to get assistance with that. However, all those groups have been entirely unresponsive. Um, so let me cut to the chase. Um, prior to coming into this room today, um, I notified um, someone from the New York State Attorney General's office as well as the City uh, Law Department of my intent to file an order to show cause application of my federal lawsuit tomorrow. Um, it's my full intent to deliver on that commitment. Um, prior to coming here uh, today, I also talked to Darren Martin from Mr. Banks' team. He essentially stonewalled me at a public resource fair meeting that the, the mayor held um, last week in the Bronx. Um, unfortunately, Vanessa Gibson is too preoccupied with uh, violating our due process rights to give us time of day. So uh, she's lying. Un unfortunately, she's not under oath. Um, so with regards to due process, what I see all around me are empty seats. When this meeting began, there were about 10 people from your panel mm -hmm. in chairs in this room. Right now, if you look around, there's Ms. Gibson, there's you. But where is um, Adrian Adams? Where is mm. um, Lori Cumbo? Where is Giovanni Williams? Where is uh, Mr. Grodinchik? So with regards to the public's right to due process, and also if you look at the ceiling, if you actually take heart what it says, where the hell is due process when I have to go home tonight? There aren't repairs being made in my building. I got 15 fucking, sorry. I got 15 punches to my left temple after there was an attempted assault on uh, May 12th. I've been in con I was in contact with HRA as early as March 10th of 2016 about a bait and switch that I talked to you about. So Mr. Banks' response to me on December 14th of 2017 was that HRA is not responsible for crime even when people put them on notice that there's a mentally unstable guy who's about six foot two or six foot four trying to kick your, kick your something in your living room and you ask for good reason for that person to be evicted uh, so that you won't be taking those 15 punches to your head. Mm. Where's the oversight? Mm. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, we appreciate uh... Yeah. Good afternoon. I'm Julian Williams. I am a member of the Safety Net Activist Group and I'm a recipient of um, public assistance. I first would want to say um, thank you to... You can pull the microphone closer to you if you don't want to. Yeah. I first want to say thank you to Urban Justice. I've been through different situations with HRA, and I want to say thank you to them for assisting me. Thanks also to the commission and his staff. I know there are a lot of issues that are not resolved, and my prayer is that we can all get things resolved so that needy people will get the assistance that we really need. I'm here to speak about students that are in college that as a college student I did the web program and it's very very difficult especially when you're in certain courses that deal with healthcare to do like certain hours when you're out of class time to be studying to be working whilst other students are really vigorously studying to really get out of the system and to move on with your career so I'm hoping that the commissioner and his staff will kind of address those situations. So students who receive public assistance and get and are in college and really want to get into the workforce can really be given more time. The time that you do work, you will be given even help. We need help, like people to assist us so we can get off the system and get um, into the workforce. Another situation I encountered is where I went for a certification with my daughter, now deceased, and my documents were mishandled or misplaced by the staff, and my case was closed right away. We suffered immensely, like for a period of six months, we didn't get SNAP benefits. Thanks to Urban Justice, um, we had to go to a fair hearing, and my benefits were restored. But I would ask that cases are not closed immediately when there's an issue. 
because sometimes it's not that documents are not submitted. I had my receipt, I had everything submitted that I was supposed to submit. And my case, my daughter and I suffered. In addition to losing my benefits, I had Lifeline. And up until this day, I tried very hard to get representation from HRE to send into the phone company to remove this charge of over $200 on my credit report, which is still there today, not for any fault of mine, but because my case was closed because of an HRE staff member's mistake or whatever they did, the computer closed my case. So I want to say thank you to Urban Justice and HRE for what you're doing, but if you could do something more to help more in deleting programs that are given to college students who are on HRE so they can focus more to get into the workforce to get their um, life independent. And if and when documents or whatever the situation is that allows any form of um, interruption with your case, not to close one's case, because sometimes it's not the recipient's fault and we suffer immensely when well-needed benefits that we need are shut down. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank this panel very much for your testimony, um, and I look forward to working with all of you uh, moving forward on all of these issues that you've uh, brought up today. And uh, I want to thank all of our panelists, uh, 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 everybody that has stayed throughout this hearing, which is you know, going on five hours now. So <laughs> I want to thank all of you for, uh, for your dedication to this issue. Obviously, um, uh, your dedication is demonstrated by uh, all of your willingness to uh, participate in this hearing. We look forward to working with all of you moving forward. I want to thank uh, Vanessa Gibson, my colleague, for, uh, for being here to the end, um, as well as committee staff, Aminta Kilowan, Tanya Cyrus, Crystal Pond, Julia Haramis, uh, and my staff, uh, Elizabeth Adams and Deidre Cheatham, who are here, um, uh, and um, Mr. Banks uh, and your staff, uh, thank you for being here uh, and staying, uh, and the speaker, all of my colleagues, and, and obviously uh, Ms. Jasmine Headley um, for uh, her very important and powerful testimony this afternoon. And with that, at 6.07 p.m., this hearing is adjourned. Yeah.